Okay, um, let's see. Now, what I'm going to start with is about the papers. And uh, hmm, I didn't mute myself, so I don't know why it's doing that. Can everybody hear me? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Good. Good. Thank you. That's all I need, because otherwise <laughs> that wouldn't work well for all of you. Thank you for a small but dedicated group that you may be. Uh, I think the most valuable thing before we get to tonight's lecture, which is a subject that I'm sure, uh, well, if you're here now, it's because I assume you're already interested in ancient Roman art. I've been to Rome four times. I have friends in Italy. Uh, I stayed with a couple of them uh, as well as was a guest of a, a private, not the government of Italy, but a private Roman, as in the city of Rome, based <coughs> tourism um, entity. I mean, it was a single person that ran it, and I met her on another trip in, in Switzerland. She said, if you want to come to Italy, this is my last trip in uh, 2002 or so, I think it was. So some of the slides I have are from much earlier, and some are from that trip. But we will probably not get to those till next week. Hopefully by then the fire, the glass fire, I guess there's several now that are up there, obviously. I know there's more than a couple. But the one that was the most threatening, according to Dr. Chong's email and the news reports, was the um, glass fire. So I'm saying some, you know, Berkeley karma prayers, whatever you want to call them, to uh, uh, hope that it doesn't affect any of my students or anyone else that any of you know. Okay, so uh, looks like one more person wants to come in, but I don't see them asking to be admitted. <laughs> oh, two people are waiting. All right, there we go. Let me do that. All right, welcome if you just joined us. Um, <clears throat> so t the papers were due this week, and most of you have finished or should have finished them before the evacuation orders came, but I realize that that's impacting people, uh, even sometimes if you're not in an evacuation area. I've gotten about five students who uh, sent me emails, but I already sent one out. I hope you all saw it, in which I will just on an honor system, of course, I'm not going to ask anyone to verify, that if any of you are impacted by the fire in any way that affects your ability to complete the paper and turn it in by midnight tonight, right, that would be for both sections. Uh, there'd be no points off and you'd have an extension, but you have to contact me. And that extension would be 72 hours beyond the date at which the evacuation orders end in Sonoma County, or let's just say Sonoma County. Obviously, some people may live north in Mendocino County. I, I don't know where all my students live. I never do, but, uh, or out, you know, Napa County. So if you're one of those people, then again, you could contact me individually by email and I would let you know that you have, you know, a further extension or you can do a makeup for the midterm. That leads to the midterm. The midterm may have to be delayed. Uh, realistically, I'm gonna just take the advice of the department chair. By the way, why am I even having a class tonight? Two reasons. I thought it's better not to get backlogged because we're supposed to cover another eight weeks of material after the midterm which may have to be delayed, that I'll have to defer to events and to the department chair and the dean. I want everyone to know this. That's where I got the uh, green light to go ahead and have a class because since it's recorded, <coughs> people can see the, the slides any other time. However, I would not give the midterm, which would cover, include Roman slides covering that, uh, if um, for any reason, you know, we, we have to delay it. I would then adjust, you know, obviously the, the timing of the midterm. At the moment, it's still scheduled for two weeks of tonight. So let's just uh, keep our fingers crossed. As far as the papers go, I want to say kudos. I got about, I think it was about 10 people sent me samples of their papers early so that they could ask for feedback. Those were excellent. They first they really were some of the best written on average. Plus a lot of the subject matter, for instance, Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with a thorn necklace is fine. But I've seen a lot of those. So I give those to my readers to grade, I'll be honest with you. But this time I got three different, totally different, two of which I've never seen. I, I've studied Frida Kahlo. I've admired her since I was in college myself. Uh, and in Mexico, I've seen her paintings. I've been to her house in Mexico City. Um, it's, it's fascinating to see how much, much she was able to 
to put into some of her paintings that weren't only about herself, but even the ones that were about herself and her life, of course, was so colorful. So my, my compliments to those of you who did that. And it doesn't guarantee that those I didn't yet preview will all get A's, but this, that's a good sign. So of course, I will start getting busy grading them tomorrow. Uh, I cannot guarantee it, but my goal is to get them back to people within two weeks. And I'll probably just send you the cover sheet. And there's no point in sending the whole file if I can do it that way. I haven't done this type of grading uh, even in the spring. All I did was send people their raw score and let them ask questions about what grade they got. But almost everybody got an A or a B, so they, hardly anybody had any complaints. But whatever, I, I will take questions. I always do uh, by either email or live Zoom class questions. Okay, so if you didn't turn your paper in, this is a helpful hint, and maybe those of you who are here tonight, one or two of you, or whatever, possibly more, didn't uh, see this. And I, my bad, I confess that about two weeks ago, it was two weeks ago tonight, I held up a piece of paper that said midterm, our 2.1 midterm. I was just on autopilot. I had, I sent you guys on email. I had not uh, stopped to adjust the phrase that my longest, uh, term reader who has been grading papers for many professors for oh, more than two years now at the JC uh, suggested and I just copied it down. So it's supposed to be this way. So if you are still working on your papers, let me see if I can yeah put it to where, whoops, there we go. I'm going to hold it up and as straight as I can. If you didn't already label your paper this way, you should re- label it and then send it to me. If you haven't already labeled it, then please make note of this, either take a screenshot or whatever, or write it down. I'll hold it up for about 60 seconds. The reason is I'm trying to get everyone to, to label your papers the same way in, in both of my sections, because there's so many, you know, dozens and dozens from two different sections that I don't want to mix them up. Or it's, it will make it much more difficult for me to enter the grades period, let alone make sure that there's no confusion, because some last names are very similar. But it's not just that, it's it's just the filing method that some of you already know this, uh, that my reader is actually the same one I mentioned, a long-term reader I've been working with for oh, almost two years myself, helping with grading. She said this was the best system she had found for making sure the papers get filed correctly and graded if quickly and and are easier to, and quicker you know, uh, to enter into the uh, roster, the grade book. Okay, um, that's all that. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Because the due date for some of you, well, it doesn't matter. I was going to make it the same for both classes because there was no class Tuesday, obviously. I, I, we were told not to have any classes at all. And then I sent that email out uh, Monday afternoon and got the response that allows us to have this. But now, before we start on tonight's topic, does anybody have any questions about the papers? Uh, that I haven't already answered. Okay, so if you didn't get one in, you still, if you don't want any points off, you have till midnight, and I will be checking my email tomorrow and starting to grade all the papers I've received as of tomorrow morning, or by tomorrow morning, you know, I'll start grading them late tomorrow. And I hope to have them done. I should be able to get them all back uh, and have the grades entered by two weeks from tonight. Okay. So tonight's topic is ancient Roman art. Uh, I, I do think that over the years and uh, my 24 years of teaching at this JC and also as I told you about nine other JCs and state university campuses when I've taught art history, it's always one of the subjects along with ancient Egypt that gets the most interest or at least it seems to, judging from my perspective as an instructor of all the topics in the first half of the semester, if not the whole semester of any ancient to medieval like this is, art history classes. Rome definitely left an impact which still affected by, I think most of you know that already from just what high school history classes or other classes you may have taken at the college level. Um, but let me ask, imagine the small group as we have tonight, um, it's not tiny, but it's less than the usual number. Has anyone uh, listening now, been to Italy or been to Rome specifically? Usually one or two have, but that's when I have a full class. Well, anyway, the reason I ask that is because if you ever will get the chance to go to Rome, give yourself a week 
Well, okay, five days minimum, but a week would be a good minimum if you have that ability or that opportunity. There's so much to see. That city is one of the richest, um, what's the right word, repositories of architectural and historic uh, archeological sites. An amazing thing about them, you'll see this when I show you my own slides, which I think will be the end of, uh, I'm not the end, the beginning of class next week, before we do the review, which will be helpful if we're gonna have the midterm. Well, I'll do the review anyway, and it'll be recorded. So if you have to miss that class, you can take a look at it in case we can hopefully still have the midterm two weeks of the night as scheduled. The point being that uh, there's so much to see in Rome I'd like to share with you, and those will be slides like usual that you don't have to take notes on. But there's enough on the syllabus, you can see it's a week and a half's worth. It's all of tonight's subject uh, uh, slides, or must knows, and then also uh, several next week. So we may get through most of the must knows tonight. We'll see how it goes and then finish up with uh, a couple more of those plus my own slides of Rome and then do the review uh, if we're going to have the midterm two weeks and tonight on schedule. We would do the review the second half of next week's lecture. Okay, so that's clear to everybody. All right, so I made another graphic. These low-tech graphics hopefully are helpful to all of you. Uh, some people have told me they find them useful. Uh, because I'm not using my whiteboard for just, you know, a few lines like this. All right, let's see if I can place it to where it's above. There we go. The Roman Empire lasted, you can do the math, if not, I'll do it for you, over 500 years as an empire with a unified government, uh, you know, system of government and language, Latin, of course, which is the root language of about a third of the <laughs> people on earth today, by the way, if you didn't know that, Latin-based languages dominate throughout this hemisphere and a huge portion of Europe and even some parts of Africa. They conquered and uh, occupied, <clears throat> ruled over 50 provinces. Those would be like nations, separate nations, during that time. Now, it's not all 50 provinces all through that 500 years. Like any empire, they had uh, periods of rising and falling you know, fortunes and, and, and you know, uh, dominance. But during that period, at least at some point, 50 different uh, nationalities or, or groups, ethnic groups were controlled by the Romans. And still those countries where the Roman Empire once ruled have physical remnants of Roman culture, whether they're above ground or below ground. And I'll show you proof of that, not just next week with my slides of Rome, but when we go to Istanbul, I'll show you some examples of Roman ruins in Istanbul. That's nearly a thousand miles from Rome in modern Turkey. The Roman empire control, now you can hear the neighbor's dogs, I hate it. <laughs> if you can't hear them, good. 220 million people. Now that won't mean much to most of you, but the world, the population of the earth back then was most historians, they can only guesstimate, but it's not a, a wild guess. It's an educated guess based on census figures and various other ways of counting the, the populations of most parts of the world had governments where they counted their people for tax purposes. Of course, those are the census figures. When you add those up, plus the, you know, uh, the Plains Indians and so forth that didn't take census, it was roughly 450 million people at the high point of the Roman Empire around 250 to 300 AD. Uh, but that means that the empire, that one empire controlled nearly half the earth's population, 45% under one government. That is the only time that's happened in human history. And then Rome was the first city on earth to reach over a million. And by the uh, high point of the empire before it began declining, Rome reached two million. That's greater Rome. Even today, that would be a a metro not a megalopolis, that's 10 million or more. There aren't that many of those in the world, a few dozen. But 2 million is still a huge city, even now. And at that point in time, nothing came close. No other city up till that time. Okay, but first we're going to talk about the Etruscans. So let me give you a little bit of background about them. They're a mysterious culture. Um, and they predated or preceded the Romans in the Italian peninsula. In fact, they ruled over Rome when Rome was, some of you know this, if you read your stocks that you should, when Rome was just a small, first a village and then a city, uh, it was completely controlled by the Etruscan kingdom. The Etruscans weren't an empire. Again, I have to explain what that difference is between an empire and a kingdom. So the Etruscans didn't conquer, well, they did conquer other, other cultures on the uh, 
Iberia, sorry, on the uh, Italian peninsula from where roughly the borders of Italy are up, to, you know, from the boot of Italy up into the uh, uh, Alps, which is roughly the same area Italy occupies today. Uh, but they didn't go out of that area and try to conquer neighboring kingdoms. Uh, but they did rule over people that spoke different languages. The Romans spoke Latin. We don't know what language the Etruscans spoke. No one has ever, if you can believe this, all these centuries of archaeology, which goes back to the late Renaissance, archaeologists have been searching for these various places, like the lost city of Atlantis, right, and Troy, and they found evidence for Troy. I already told you that with the slide last week. Uh, in any case, with the Etruscans, no one's ever found any evidence of what language they spoke. Uh, or of what music they played, except for their artwork. That gives us hints, and you're going to see some of that tonight. So the Etruscans were the culture that occupied uh, uh, the dominant culture, uh, the Italian peninsula, for about 400 years. That's a long time. Um, and they included it in their kingdom uh, what was soon to become a more powerful city, and that overthrew them and conquered and destroyed the Etruscans. When they did that, they conquered every Etruscan city, the Romans, they rebelled against the Etruscans. We'll get into that. Okay, and then we have the uh, period of uh, the golden age of Etruscan uh, culture, which you're gonna see examples of the inside of a couple of their tombs. I've been in their tombs. It's both creepy <laughs> and, and thrilling to go inside an Etruscan tomb underground that's been buried for 3,000 or 2,500 years, even earlier than the Romans were doing it. Uh, of course, the Romans didn't always bury people. They often cremated them. So on your um, you know, list of terms, you should all have these out. We're going to cover, uh, the first one will be cult of the dead. I hope that gets some of your uh, creative or curiosity <laughs> juices flowing, because it's a bizarre concept. No other ancient culture had this particular religious belief. I will give you the definition when we're on the first slide. The cult of the dead is an Etruscan concept. Sarcophagus isn't specifically Etruscan, but the first slide is a sarcophagus. And then necropolis, also something not only specific to the Etruscans. When we get to the Romans, I always like to give you a heads up. You're not going to have to write definitions of, uh, of all of these terms, uh, but there will be two, the third and fourth, that I will ask you to write definitions of. Triumphal arches and aqueducts. And I apologize if I didn't leave, I should have three lines between those two. Because uh, those definitions are about two lines each, but there you can write them at the bottom, whatever uh, uh, you know, on the margin or in the bottom. Um, and the other terms are just things that will come up in the slides. But that list might appear on the fill-in section of the midterm. We're going to talk about how to study for that next week. Um, I might say name two of the things invented by ancient Romans, or maybe four, but I wouldn't do more than that. Probably just two out of that list. Okay. So now let's keep our fingers crossed uh, that we can get this screen share going. And not just that, but that you can all see it. Okay. Um, and uh, get it larger. Okay, I do need someone to, whoops, to confirm. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to go back. Uh, that you guys can see this slide. Uh, yeah, I can see it. Good, thank you. Yeah, that's always helpful. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, I'm talking to an empty screen, right? Or you're looking at one. Okay, this is the first must know. So of course, it, you need to start taking notes now. Uh, this is, the title is one word. So it's a nice, easy one to, to write and hopefully remember. Sarcophagus, one word, the title. S-A-R-C-O-P-H-A. G U S again one more time S A R C O P H A G U S sarcophagus or as my aunt in Indiana I've quoted her many times she's passed away a couple of years ago my favorite relative on my mom's side she used to say the words wrong though she knew her history and her art she was very well educated but she's from Indiana hey anybody from Indiana I apologize but it, it's half my heritage so I can say this they don't know how to pronounce foreign names place names or, or people's names she would call this word sarcophagus that might help you if it doesn't ignore it as a phonetic mispronunciation of the word sarcophagus and the location is a city in Italy Cerveteri C-E-R-V-E-T-E-R-I again C-E-R-V-E-T-E 
R-I, Servitary. The date is 520 BC or BC. Okay, so what are we looking at? Well, let's start with the definition, of course. It, it, it's not a long definition. Sarcophagus is a large, you should be writing this course, a large stone or metal box containing the remains of a deceased human being, containing the remains of a deceased human being, comma, often with decorations on the outside. Didn't have to, but, but they usually did. So often with decorations on the outside, period. All right, so this is obviously a sarcophagus. It's stone, if that isn't obvious. And it once contained the rem, uh, you know, remains, right? The bodies deceased uh, of these two uh, adults. If it's not obvious, they are a couple and they are married we have some evidence of what this tomb was, uh, where they were buried. This now, if you're curious, you have to write this, but it's in the Louvre in Paris. So it was taken out of Italy. Again, if it happened, as I know it did in the very early 1800s, the only culprit I could think of is Napoleon, <laughs> because he ordered his soldiers in every part of the empire he conquered, which was on three continents, you know, part of, uh, well, most of uh, Egypt and part of Syria and most of Europe, right? Until he made the foolish, mistake of invading Russia, uh, that empire, he took things from each of the cultures that, that uh, his soldiers occupied. Well, he didn't personally do it, but his soldiers would, or his, uh, you know, uh, diplomats who went there to become the local rulers over the population. So many of those objects ended up at the Louvre. That's where this is. Okay, now back to the notes. Well, let's start with who were they? We don't know exactly their names. We don't know that much, but we know they were an upper class couple, members of the ruling class. How do we know? By the way, they're dressed and the fact that their uh, sarcophagus was found inside one of those fancy tombs which only the upper classes could afford. So we don't know if they were necessarily a local ruler like a mayor, not necessarily that specific, but we know they were part of the ruling or upper classes because of course the upper classes were the ruling class in the ancient world. Some would say nothing's changed, but in any case, that was true in the Etruscan kingdom. So it's a husband and wife, and what are they doing? They're watching servants and or slaves, some were paid, some weren't, whose bodies were interred with them when they died. They weren't killed and put in the tomb with the, this couple when that couple died. And of course, the husband could have died before the wife or vice versa. So eventually, both of their bodies, this couple's, bodies were inside this sarcophagus with their portraits on top and made in advance, of course, obviously, and then perhaps placed there when the, both bodies were inside. It looks like there, it's a separate piece of sculpture. It's hard to tell. If you're curious about this line, you don't have to write this by any means, but it is, you could say it's part of the meaning. That's how it was transported to Paris from Italy. The French archaeologists slash thieves, however you want to write that, that took it without permission from Italy to France, cut it in half, partly to see what was inside. It was just bones. That's all that was left. And those are gone. If you're curious, those are not at the Louvre. <laughs> I don't know what they did with them. Probably took them to some science lab. Anyway, so, so they cut it in half to transport it. But they didn't drop it, at least, unlike Nefertiti. Remember, we talked about that story. Nefertiti's bust was dropped by the fools, the, the thieves that stole it from uh, Egypt and took it to Germany somewhere along the way and damaged. And this wasn't damaged. Um, it's intact. And so we have an idea of what they, the upper classes of the Etruscan kingdom look like, what, how they dressed, what they had dreads, you can see that in their hair. And we have, now we have the second definition. We know this about them. So this, it, it, there's, there's no mystery to this. What are they doing? When I started to say they were watching entertainment being performed by some of their former servants, their family, slaves, some of them were slaves, some of them were not. But in any case, they would eventually be, as per their religious custom, those people's bodies buried along without a sarcophagus, probably just a regular coffin, in the same tomb. So that why? Here's why. It's called the cult of the dead. So that's your second definition now for tonight. What does that mean? Okay, the cult of the dead. Now, this is a strange one, and only the Etruscans believe this, in, at least in the ancient world. Um, the cult of the dead was an uh, Etruscan religious belief 
in which they thought that their deceased ancestors would come to life every night inside their tombs and party until sunrise throughout eternity. That's it in a single long sentence. I'll say it again. It's an Etruscan religious belief in which they felt that their deceased ancestors would come to life inside their tombs and party. I mean, that's the only way I can put it. You can use a different word, celebrate, whatever, uh, until dawn every night through eternity. So supposedly they're still doing this. We won't know because, the and I'm just kidding now, the Italian government uh, <laughs> has not allowed anyone inside these at night, except maybe some archeologists. We have no evidence that there's any bizarre activity after dark in these tombs. They're all over Italy. They are in, here's the third uh, new definition for tonight, and it's really short, okay? These are in what we call a necropolis, these tombs. So here's the definition for that word. A city of the dead, that literally is the meaning, that's a, 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 a Greek word, some of you know that. Necropolis, which is a city of the dead with fancy tombs arranged along a street-like pattern. Okay, once again, uh, a city of the dead with fancy tombs arranged along a street-like pattern. So they quite literally arranged these tombs, which were underground, buried in the side of a mountain or a hill, or even straight down into the earth, with long tunnels. And they were protected, uh, I'm sure, by guards, as well as by, you know, heavy doors and gates and so forth. In any case, they weren't visible from the um, uh, surface, except for some marker of some kind to say this family's tomb is here. And they were protected by gates, if you're curious. Uh, that's the way they are in Italy now. I visited uh, this cemetery where this, this necropolis, where, where this originally came from. And the museum is just outside the cemetery gates. And I can tell you if, <laughs> if you have um, a curiosity about what type of physical um, intimacy <laughs> was practiced in each of these ancient cultures we've been covering, you can't find a more graphic set of images, and that's all I'll say. I won't get too specific here. I don't want to get in trouble. Then the paintings on vases inside that museum of the uh, Etruscans that were buried at, in that cemetery. Okay, so here we have, I'll summarize again, an upper class couple enjoying the entertainment all night long when they come back to life inside their own tomb as part of that cult of the dead, and they are buried in a tomb that's inside a necropolis. They were, of course, inside the sarcophagus. Okay, so let's do a formal analysis. It is unbalanced clearly towards the right. Okay, uh, but is it unbalanced top to bottom? I don't think so. If you draw the line across here, when you add this, you know, rather large bulky section and the, f the foot or whatever leg, uh, I think of it as roughly balanced, top to bottom. The two figures and, and the bed they're lying on are almost the same size. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the bed itself, and that's a wooden bed with a very, looks like a very modern type of uh, comfortable <laughs> stuffed mattress here. In any case, some kind of mattress. And of course, their clothing, their uh, feet, their hands, their hair, their faces, that's all done with carved line. And of course, that creates simulate texture on the hair and the clothing and uh, the, the bed. Lots of realistic, sharp simulated texture. There's no modeling. This is in total darkness, of course, once the tomb was shut tight, at least until the parting began, which I, I assume they had torches inside. Um, <clears throat> in any case, there was no technique for modeling. And the largest mass is the bed, then the, the husband, then the wife. There's no debating that. There is only one technique for space, and that's overlapping. Uh, the wife overlaps the husband. They both overlap the bed. Uh, but it is real space, too. This is a single large, you know, life-size, I meant to say, a life-size image of two adults, uh, you know, two adult human beings. Uh, and, and so it's real space as well as the technique of overlapping is used here. It's a warm color. I think you can tell that kind of a... Uh, tan earth earthy tone and um, 
I think I've covered it. Yeah, modeling, rhythm. Oh, dynamic or stable, sorry, I forgot. I would say mostly stable. Look carefully, they're sitting upright and they're lying flat out with their feet stretched almost all the way uh, out to the end of the bed and the bed is completely stable. So only a couple of details, of course, the top part of where the pillows would be, I guess, and the tops of their heads. Now, I've had uh, one or two students over the years, I've taught this class, and one of them was your former fire chief, by the way, one of my uh, uh, friends, I made friends with him, he was, I think he's retired now. Maybe if you, if you looked along with Tony Penny, he was fire chief of Santa Rosa City Fire Department. Quite busy even back then, but nowhere near as busy he, as he'd be if he was still working at that job now. He, he came up with this silly comment. You see what their fingers, their hands, you know, look at that gesture. So what is it they're saying to each other? And he came up with that. Oh, it's obvious. Where's the remote? You had it last. Is it behind the sofa? I don't know, forget it. Anyway, that is not what we think. That's not what they're saying. Okay, now you can rest your hands, <laughs> sorry to say pens, for just the next two slides. I just want you to see what the inside of some of these tombs look like. Look at their paintings. Uh, this isn't a must know, right? We'll get to the next must know. Uh, actually, the tomb of the lionesses in Tarquina. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this is not that tomb, so I'm going to cut it off the study list. I'm giving you a break, but I want you to see this so you can see where the these uh, uh, sarcophagi, right? More than one sarcophagus, <laughs> this is sarcophagi, a group of them, uh, where where they would have been uh, buried, entombed. These are all underground, not just like, you know, 10 feet. We're talking about tunnels leading to the entrances that were steeply down uh, sloped. And they had stairs, of course. And they were, oh, I, the ones I've been in were 100 feet long, you know, heading down into the ground. So these are damp and musty places. Not a lot of tourists like going there, but it's, I think it's worth the trip if you have the time if you're in Italy and near one of these. Okay, so Tomb of the Lionesses, since it, 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 this is another tomb. I'm going to cross it off, but that is from that same period, roughly, you know, within a few decades of the sarcophagus. So the same style of art would have been used in the sarcophagus in which the first slide, that couple that we saw lying across their bed, would have been uh, buried or interred. Technically, they weren't buried, right, because there wasn't dirt right over them. The right word is interred. But look at the fresco painting. Look how wonderful. Let's get this a little larger here. You can see that they're uh, uh, being entertained, whoever the upper class, you know, deceased ancestors who occupied this tomb, you know, over hundreds of years. These tombs are large enough they could hold gener several generations worth of, uh, you know, the same family. And then these were the servants who also came to life at night. And uh, I think you can see here, this appears to be a woman because her, her skin is, uh, or it's not certain, might not be, but certainly we know these are males here with uh, the uh, darker skin tones. And they're dancing, singing, um, you know, or some of them of course are serving the, uh, well, they were their masters, you could say it that way, even if they weren't slaves, they were, you know, employees of, servants of, or slaves of. Uh, and then we have them over here. Let's look at this section here. Uh, music being played and um, dancing and all kinds of, you know, live entertainment, of course, food and drink and so forth. So we have here what looked like, at first I thought this might be the Tomb of the Lionesses, which I actually have been in. It's not, this is not a lioness. <laughs> uh, that's a large house cat, I think, or maybe a small bobcat of some kind. They made house pets, of course, just like the Egyptians did, of various kinds of felines. Okay, so you don't have to write any of that, but I thought you'd find it interesting. And then here's, whoops, went too far. This uh, next slide is also not a must know, but I want, this is the tomb in which the sarcophagi, our first slide tonight, was interred. And each one of these, I think you can tell this, these grooves here are for, you know, placing a different sarcophagus. Uh, you see how many they could get? Dozens and dozens and dozens, you know, centuries worth of uh, ancestors buried here. This tomb's a little different because the walls are not just uh, flat with frescoes. These uh, are bas-relief panels. Again, this isn't a must-know, but I just think it's fascinating. And then look at all the things on the walls that they had to guard or to what? Here's the other theory. 
that their servants, again, you don't have to write this, you have enough already on the cult of the dead, but in that cult or, or religious belief, the, the idea was that you brought your ancestors, I think at least once a week was, was what historians have gathered or figured out, about once a week you brought the, to, the, to the entrance uh, just in front of the locked door to the tombs inside, uh, goods of every kind that they could imbibe or ingest, you know, dry goods, fruit, wine in jugs. Well, here's a wine jug, right? Because that's not obvious. Uh, and then the tools on the wall, of course, could, could be used for defending themselves or for perhaps even some, you know, like... Uh, knife throwing contest or we don't know for sure we do know that food was brought almost certainly to the entrance and guess what it would be gone by the time those same you know uh descendants of those relatives of the deceased uh people inside uh came back the next time well of course i think we all know the explanation to that is the people who maintain the cemeteries the guards right that kept a watch over the tombs and over the gate entrance, and they went and took the food home. I'm sure uh, there's probably no question of that. But but the people that brought it thought, oh, see, Uncle So and So took his the food, and, and uh, Aunt So and So got her wine. Yeah. Okay, this is a must know. Okay, this is the next must know. And this one is Porta Augusta, P O two words P O R T A, and then Augusta. A-U-G-U-S-T-A, -A. Porta Augusta, and the location is Perugia. That's a city in Italy. I've never seen this, but I've seen other gates like it. Perugia is spelled P-E-R-U-G-I-A, P-E-R-U-G-I-A. Okay, this was 200 B.C. or B.C.E. So we're looking at the last surviving gate and wall of an ancient Etruscan city. In all of Italy, it's the only, you don't have to say last, you can say it either way in your notes, which of course you should be writing this. Um, the last and only surviving gate and wall section, it's only a section of the walls around this ancient city, which was an Etruscan city. Why? Did, and why didn't the other survive? I kind of hinted at it, but I'll go ahead and tell you. By this time, the Romans had become dominant and overthrown the Etruscan their Etruscan rulers and begun expanding their kingdom to overtake Etruscans around them, all the Etruscan cities. When they took one of those cities, they just destroyed it. <laughs> that was a Roman way. If you resisted them at all, your you know, city, your kingdom, whatever, was just totally annihilated. The population sold into slavery, of course, and maybe the warriors perhaps all massacred. And they usually tore down the Etruscan cities uh, walls and built their own Roman fortresses and walled cities. But not here, because this city held out for decades against the Romans. I don't know how many years, 20 or something. And so they had some grudging respect, the Roman army that conquered, the finally conquered the city. So uh, they conquered it in about 100. So it survived, what, a century under Etruscan rule behind these walls. It wasn't under siege the whole time. <laughs> they would have certainly starved before that. But it was for many years it held out against the Romans. And when the Romans took it, they decided we're going to leave it partly out of grudging respect, but mostly because what the heck, we'll use it as our own fort, fortified city. So these walls were then converted to Roman fortified walls. Now this, it should be obvious, is not part of the Roman construction. If it isn't, you should write that. This is much later. This is a Renaissance era of sort of small, it's not a palace really, but a, you know, a, an apartment. I mean, that's what it is. It's a penthouse apartment on top of a 2000 year old uh, wall uh, looking out over the city of Perugia. And so everything above, I'm gonna draw the line now to be obvious, the white stone, all that's original. And you can see this is what this looked like originally. There was nothing above the top of the stone wall. So these two tapering, right? You see they're tapering like the uh, pylons at uh, Karnak that we saw. Remember with Ramses, the pylons of Ramses II. That, that's something that the Etruscans couldn't have known about. They didn't travel to Egypt. Later, the Romans, certainly, they conquered Egypt. But, but just some cultures just chose to do that to make it uh, uh, a little bit more difficult, perhaps, to scale. Although you'd think if it was straight, it'd be harder. Uh, easier to, to fight off the soldiers who might have tried, the Roman soldiers, to grapple 
throwing up hooks, right? Metal hooks with ropes, of course. It's grappling hooks, they're called, to try and scale these walls. Uh, then they could easily kill them off as they tried climbing these walls. These are about 50 feet high, by the way, so pretty good height. Okay, so this is the only decorated section here. Uh, so you see the Etruscans are credited, this is an important detail about the meaning of this slide. They are credited with having invented the round arch. The right word is round dead because it's not round would imply a circle, but obviously you can see how that looks. There had been no such arches used for structural purposes to help support the weight of a wall or a gate like this before the Etruscans that we know of anywhere in Europe or, or the world. So Etruscans, you see many historians, it's always safer to write that way, believe the Etruscans, or you can say credit the Etruscans with inventing the curved or rounded arch, rounded with a DD. And the Romans are often misidentified as inventing it. They took the idea from the Etruscans and used it to much greater extent, of course. We'll get to that later tonight. Okay, so that's about all there is to say about this, about the meaning of it. So for uh, space, let's do that. It's real, it's an architectural site. So of course, remember, there's no techniques for space. So if any of you did papers on architecture, I hope you remembered I said this a couple times. Uh, not to say there are no techniques for space and just move on, you get zero credit for that section of your paper because it's the dimensions you need to know. So these are 50, roughly 50 foot high walls with about a 25 foot high uh, opening or archway. That's it, that's the real space. The texture is the real rough texture of the stone, of course. There's no cemented texture here. There is rhythm, both in the two you know, uh, side pylons, that's what they are. You can say towers if you want, they are towers. The soldiers stood up here, so you could just say towers. Uh, tapering, two tapering towers, there's your alliteration for tonight. Uh, th those, of course, are the same basic shape. Uh, if they're not exactly the same size, they're the same shape. And then there's some one little bit of decoration and then the two arches here on the gateway. So there is rhythm. It is almost entirely stable on the main walls and dynamic on the two arches, plus these decorative features. So you could say it's both. You could make the case the tapering of the towers makes them slightly dynamic. Um, and then we have um, line, it's just visual line around the edges where of course here the modeling is from the sun, it's natural modeling. So underneath the arches and at the edges of the towers, you see visual line. Uh, the largest mass, well, in this photo, it appears to be the tower on the left. You just say it that way. Then the uh, gateway, because that's all you can write about is what you see in the slide. So what's visible here is then second largest would be the middle section, the, the two gates. Uh, I'm sorry, the two archways or the main gate second largest. And the third largest would be, of course, the tower. We can't see as much of it. Uh, on the right, <clears throat> the color is a cool gray color and it is roughly balanced. If you could see the whole photo, you'd see that the two towers are very close, not exactly the same width, but close. And they are projecting towers for defensive purposes. The walls are, you know, all what's left the Romans didn't take down was, I think it goes for, uh, yeah, it does. I've seen video of it. Uh, though I've never been to the city. Uh, they, they go for several blocks on either side of the gateway, the original Etruscan walls. Okay, now moving on. This is a really important slide and I will say that uh, you're gonna see more than usual of what I have been saying. Let's just do this so I don't have, I mean you, so I, I don't have to guess what I'm saying. This slide, I apologize, I should have said it while we were on it, but you, you have your notes in front of you. If you are marking the slides that I give you a heads up on as being too important to cut from the study list, I won't cut this slide when we review for the midterm, whenever it is. Uh, this is one of those, okay? And then the next one isn't until oh, that's that important. This one, She-Wolf, and you'll see why. It's a very important work of art. Two words, and I don't have to spell those, right? She-Wolf, Rome, of course, you can all spell. 500 BC or BCE. This is a bronze sculpture of a mother wolf, you can say. You can just say she wolf if you want. That's what the uh, title at the museum. It's in the Vatican Museum in Rome, which is where the Pope lives, right? Not in the museum, <laughs> in the Vatican. But you can just say Rome. That's why we wrote it that way. Uh, it's a 2,500-year-old uh, bronze sculpture uh, created by the Etruscans as a gift to the Romans in that city when they were ruling over the Roman. 
when the Romans were part of the Etruscan kingdom or dominated, you can say, uh, by the Etruscans. Why would they do that? They actually were rather bitter enemies. They fought, that is the Romans, several different, well, rebellions. They stayed, you could say, or had several rebellions to try and overthrow the Etruscan rulers, finally succeeding, of course, and then expanding slowly but steadily out from there until, of course, they conquered all of Italy and then all of the, the Mediterranean. We'll get to that in a few more slides. So why would the Etruscans make a gift to their enemies like this, their rebellious province of Rome? Uh, or, or not province, a city, city-state. It's just a town. Um, because they were trying to placate them. That's what most historians believe. So we can say that this was meant as a gesture of goodwill or a uh, an attempt to placate the Romans. And you could you, you can't say pacify. That has different meaning. You know, it has a kind of negative connotation, obviously. Uh, so we don't say pacify per se, but just to buy the peace or, you know, uh, encouraged the uh, Romans to accept Etruscan domination. You could say it that way. So why is this a she-wolf with two human babies suckling underneath? What's that have to do? Well, some of you know this, you should, with uh, as being a gift to Rome. Why is that considered appropriate? Because it is an example, or you could say this sculpture is a uh, an image of the foundation myth of Rome. I mentioned the word foundation myth last week's so remember with the uh, slide of the um, <clears throat> ancient Greek, right, two different uh, vases, the vase paintings. So this is a foundation myth illustrated in bronze as a piece of sculpture, which is, some of you know the story, but if you don't, you should be writing this. I'll keep it brief. The Romans believe they were founded by <clears throat> Uh, two brothers, Romulus, don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> I would have written that on here, but I was running out of room. Romulus with two U's, well, actually three, Romulus, and Remus, R-E-M-U-S. Two brothers named Romulus and Remus, that would be them down here, were abandoned by their parents in the woods where Rome now sits, the city of Rome, but back then it was just a forest. And they were found or adopted is really the right word, by a um, female wolf as her own cubs and raised as though they were her own cubs until, of course, they were too old to, to be her cubs. And that explains everything. One of my favorite phrases I heard in a museum once uh, of a, um, Alexander the Great. He had a domineering mother. That's why he had to conquer the world. Somebody said in front of the line in front of me. Well, that explains things. Sometimes these stories explain a lot about that culture. How does that have to do with the Romans? Well, everyone knows this. The Romans were violent. They were territorial. And they were uh, domineering over all the cultures around them. They were also very advanced in other ways. But when it came to their you know, political system, they, of course, in military system, they were domineering and they were of course violent and uh you know obviously they fought and conquered all of it and they were territorial that's so so are wolves and so that explains some people think uh, historians have said why the romans had that myth of course it's a myth obviously um it's possible people have found you know um human um children mostly younger like grade school age children uh, abandoned somehow or lost in the woods and survived somehow with the help of various wildlife. I mean, I've read those things, but they're rare and there's no proof of this. So it just called it a foundation myth. And that's why the Etruscans created this piece of sculpture as a gift to show that they were trying to display respect for the Romans' uh, history, their own foundation myth. Did it work? No, because shortly after this piece was given to the Romans, they put it on display probably in their, you know, uh, capital, I mean, in their, uh, you know, main temple, let's say. Um, they rebelled successfully shortly after this and kicked the Etruscans out and then went on their own campaign to conquer all of Italy. So it didn't work, but it was an attempt to placate uh, or uh, <clears throat> pass, you could say, mo mollify, yeah, that's a good word, mollify the Romans <clears throat> who were constantly rebelling against them. There are historians who believe these two, and I think Stock's daddy is, in fact, I know she is, that these two uh, babies were added during the Renaissance when the Vatican uh, put this she-wolf on display. That could easily be the case, but even if it is true, 
there's a lot of evidence that that's what this looked like when it was newly cast. And the last thing to say about the meaning of this is the Etruscans were the greatest bronze, sorry, bronze sculptors of the ancient world. Uh, the Romans themselves said that about them. They captured the personality and the details of both human and animal figures more realistically than any other ancient culture in bronze. And here's some evidence of that. Look at the face of that uh, very, you know, determined, protective, uh, and aggressive at the same time stance of a mother wolf protecting her human cubs. <laughs> okay, so the meaning, it's a cool color. It almost looks blue, doesn't it? I've seen it and it has kind of a bluish gray color to the uh, bronze. It's, it's not the warm color some bronze is. Uh, and then it's uh, of course, uh, both stable and dynamic, but she's mostly stable. Look carefully, just her lower legs are. The two humans, they're, they're somewhat upright. The two babies, Romulus and Remus here, their arms and legs are dynamic. So it's a, it's a bit of both. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the, uh, the face, the ears and all the features on the face of the she-wolf. Uh, the teats here and the two humans and their legs, the wolf's legs, she wolf's legs. So powerful rhythm. The arch oh, sorry, architecture. <laughs> anatomical detail is superbly sharp and realistic, all of which, of course, that is on the hair and the, the uh, skin of both the humans and the wolf and the facial features, all done with carved line. It's balanced. Oh, yeah, definitely balanced, depending on where you want to draw the line. But you know, if you draw it down the middle here, it's pretty well balanced. And I would argue that if you do the line down the middle of the she-wolf, it's balanced. And then the two humans are the same size. So, so it's easy which the largest mass is, the she-wolf. And then the two uh, humans are the same size. Um, and there's no modeling. It's a lighting from the museum. Um, okay. And, and uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, for space, it's, it's the size of, uh, there's no techniques for space. It's a real three-dimensional optic in the size of an actual adult uh, female wolf or she wolf and two human babies. Okay, now we get to one that is one of those again that's so important that you want to take extra thorough notes and I'll give you even an A. This has an extremely high possibility of appearing uh, on one or another section. There are two main sections where slides will appear on the midterm. We'll cover more of that next week. Uh, one is the slide identification section and the other is the slide analysis. It could be on either one, it won't be on both of those two sections. So you should take extra careful notes, okay? The next must know. Okay, it is um, um, Augustus of Prima Porta. Augustus, like the month of August, right, which is named after this man, as some of you know. Uh, Augustus with a U.S. at the end. Augustus of uh, Prima Porta, one word I'll spell that. P-R-I-M-A-P-O-R-T-A, P-R-I-M-A-P-O-R-T-A, -A -A, Rome, 20 B.C. or B.C.E. Okay, let's start with the fact that this is a life-size portrait of Augustus Caesar. You can just say Augustus because he only went by the one name because he was the most famous and powerful person on earth during his life. There is no debating that. None. Why? Because he is the first Roman emperor and he ruled over the largest empire uh, in the world at that time with the most population, the most wealth, the most military power. If you want to write it, just say the largest and most powerful empire, the Roman empire. He ruled over it. In fact, he helped create it. And we'll say how in a few minutes. So it's a really important portrait of the first Roman emperor named Augustus. Okay, well, there's more to it than that. So let's say, what was it and where was it when it was first created? Well, there are some debates, and I think Stockstead takes a different point of view than most of the historians I've read. So we'll just say that there are two leading theories of how and why, or not how and why, why and where this statue was, was placed. Uh, first, and the one most historians I ever just say many, keep, keep it simple, many historians believe that this sculpture was placed over the main entrance 
in the Roman walls around the city of Rome. And if you go to Rome, here's another mind blowing fact. The walls are nearly intact for miles. The old 2000 plus year old walls. They're huge, they're 60 feet high in some places and they're only missing a few stones or bricks here and there, uh, mostly along the top or the corners and things where it's worn down a bit. Uh, that open gateway is now a road that leads into the city of Rome, which cars use and trucks and uh, motorbikes and, and, and uh, pedestrians. So it's a main entrance to the city of Rome even now. But let's just say it again, that this sculpture, many historians believe, the portrait of their first emperor was placed above the main gateway on the north side because there were multiple gates. Just say the main gate on the north entrance to the city of Rome, which was, of course, part of the Roman walls around their city. Okay, that's one theory. That means you would have to walk under him to get into, if you're coming from the north, into the city of Rome. Makes sense. That's the kind of thing the Romans did everywhere they went. His statue wasn't only in that place, it was all over the empire in, in many of their other capitals of their provinces. So, so it, that's most likely at least one explanation. Another is that it was uh, made for a later Roman emperor who admired Augustus and wanted statues of him and some of his other predecessors, other Roman, earlier Roman emperors, at his villa, and that would be uh, Hadrian in a, uh, a different part of the Roman Empire. Uh, yeah, we know that those statues, copies of this statue were there, but the date that this is, 20 BC, he didn't even, he wasn't alive yet. Hadrian wasn't even a child. And so just say most historians believe it was originally created and then copies were made and sent to other parts of the Roman Empire over the next several decades. But the original piece was very likely above the main gate. Okay, so one more uh, fact about uh, not one more fact, sorry, the whole other part of the meaning, <laughs> the whole other section in your notes should be, who was Augustus besides just saying he was the first Roman emperor? And I said he was the most powerful man on earth. He was a hero to the people of Rome, at least in Italy, the main province. But he really was admired throughout the empire because we know that other parts, other not all the provinces, uh, certainly not the Jewish provinces. They didn't admire him. Uh, they didn't want to be conquered. But many other uh, provinces in the empire admired uh, and even built statues like this, not the exact same you know, copies, but similar ones, for their local uh, temples. And they even declared him a god in some of the provinces and built temples to him as though he were a living god. He didn't ask for that. Apparently, he was more modest than some Roman emperors who thought they were gods on earth, but he didn't think that. But he wasn't exactly, you know, a, a, a shrinking violet. So here's a fact you should write now. i just keep it simple. He was the man who avenged the death of his uncle, Julius. Uh, you all know the story of Julius Caesar, right? He was stabbed to death by, you know, uh, dozens of times in the Roman Forum on his way into the Senate by senators. So just say he was assassinated. And uh, this man was his nephew. He was only 20 years old when he led the Roman army to avenge the murder of his uncle. And when he won that, okay, he became the first emperor because people were so happy to have him. Uh, not the first emperor. He became one of, oops, I misspoke, you guys. I apologize. He became one of the three rulers of the uh, transition between the empire and the republic. It started out, Rome was, was a republic. They voted, they had democracy, only of course, white males who owned property, but they had some kind of limited democracy, just like Athens. And then they overthrew that when they uh, decided to allow Augustus to become their first emperor. So he didn't immediately become emperor. So I'll rephrase it, okay? After he defeated the enemies of, or murderers, assassins, you can say, of his uncle, Julius, he became the most powerful man in Rome, but he didn't rule by himself. He, he was part of a three man. It's called a triumvirate. Don't ask me to spell that word, but you've heard that some of those, right? A lot of, a lot of cultures have that kind of transitional period. Uh, the, the, the communist empire did that when the Soviet Union was on after Stalin died. They had three rulers for a while until Khrushchev took over. So what you had was three rulers and he was the most powerful. So how did he become the first sole ruler or a single uh, um, emperor? In a second civil war, because of course, I didn't say this, so if you want to write this now about what I just said about that rebellion, of course it was a rebellion. Uh, the people that killed his uncle, Julius, were trying to form their own government and, and overthrow Julius Caesar's family. 
And so they didn't succeed. They were captured and, and executed, every one of them. So that's a civil war. So he won the first civil war. Less than 20 years later, not even 10 years, sorry, 10 years later, a second rebellion happened. And that was Marcus Augustus, Mark, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Mark Anthony. I misspoke, uh, you guys, I apologize. Mark Antony and Cleopatra rebelled against Rome, trying to overthrow the Roman Empire to form their own, you know, ruling couple. They were a couple, of course, uh, and they wanted to uh, take over the entire empire. And of course, you know what happened. They both died. He is the one who defeated them. So what does that mean? Here's how you can summarize it if you're, you know, just kind of wanting to keep to the high points. What I just said, you can summarize it in like three sentences. Augustus was the nephew of Julius Caesar. He defeated the rebellion against his uncle who had been assassinated, Julius, and therefore became one of three rulers of the Roman Empire, but the most powerful of those joint rulers. You just say joint, but they were triumphant. Then about 10 years later, you could just say several years later, a second rebellion happened, creating a second civil war. I mean, that's two civil wars. We barely survived our only civil war. <laughs> I mean, how many cultures have two civil wars within 10 years? And he won that one too. And he was barely 30 years old. And then the people and Senate of Rome were so grateful, they declared him uh, their emperor, sole ruler. And he ruled for 45 years. That's the last, now there's only two more facts to put in your notes about this slide. You won't have to remember all of these things. Remember, I said this, but if it wasn't clear, you only have to write two short paragraphs on each of the slide analysis of six or more sentences. Okay, so five, uh, I mean six, sorry, six sentences, six facts. I'm giving you way more than that. So just pick out the facts when you're reviewing for the test. Of course, you'll have the notes in front of you so you could just read them uh, that you think are the most important or interesting or easiest to remember. Okay, uh, when the test, you know, if, if, and I said there's a high possibility it will be. So to wrap up the meaning on this and then we'll do a quick formal analysis. Augustus ruled longer than any other Roman emperor. Not only was he the first, he was the longest ruling. 45 years, that's his whole lifetime for poor people back then, didn't live much past 50. Uh, so it was a re remarkable achievement. And he instituted that period of peace and prosperity. Some of you know the phrase, you don't have to write it, but who, if you want to, it's called Pax, P-A-X, of course means peace, Romana, just like it sounds. Pax Romana means the beginning of a 200 year period of peace and stability uh, in which only some minor wars are fought along the borders, you know, with certain provinces that were rebellious like Israel <laughs> and a couple others we'll talk about. Uh, but uh, uh, mostly it was a time of peace and stability and he, he started that. So the last fact about the meaning, let's look at this. Who is that? That's Cupid. That is of course a symbol of love. Everyone knows an angel of love, right? A, a mythical angel of love. So that is symbolic of the fact that when this sculpture was made, the people of Rome were so grateful to this man for having saved them from two civil wars that would have torn their whole world apart, that not only did they declare him emperor, they had sculpture and, and, and you know, statues, in other words, of him uh, created all over the empire. And this one, copies of it were sent, remember, all over the empire, uh, includes a, a symbol of the love of the people of Rome for their ruler. He was a popular ruler. That doesn't mean he didn't have people executed and there weren't a few enemies. Yeah, of course there were some. Uh, and he crushed them all, of course, usually with his secret police, but you don't have to write that part. Um, <clears throat> in any case, he was a very um, successful, <laughs> stable, uh, powerful, and popular. There you go, all of those above, you can say. And maybe a little arrogant, but not really according to everything I've read, some biographies of him. Uh, his arm is raised, showing that he knows how powerful he is, so you can say he's extremely self-confident, but I wouldn't say arrogant. There were plenty of Roman rulers that were, we'll get to a couple of them probably before the end of this evening, with some of the other slides, that were beyond arrogant. That S-H-I-T crazy, <laughs> some of them. He was not. He was stable, sane, popular, rational, and obviously extremely skilled and talented. Okay, he wouldn't have survived 45 years on the throne if he wasn't. All right, formal analysis. It's a warm color. This may look cool gray, but uh, let's see if we can get uh, here. It does, but you can see there, that's the yellow color of the marble. And you can see it here. It's really good simulated texture. By the way, that's his successor, his son, his adopted son. You don't have to write that. 
you have enough notes on the meaning, but if you want to, you could add that. On his armor is a depiction of his successor he had designated in his will because his own sons had died, his biological sons, from mysterious circumstances. And we'll get to that later. What happened to them? We don't know, but there are theories. But all we know is they didn't survive very long after uh, they became adults. So he declared his adopted son by his second wife his uh, successor, and that's who that is on his armor. All of that's done with carved line, and that creates very realistic simulated texture on the robe, so, you know, his armor, his hair, his face, uh, everywhere you look. Uh, and then we have the masses. Well, he's the largest mass. And then I guess the spear he's holding, that's supposed to be a spear, I guess it's missing the tip. Uh, it's probably a modern replacement of an older one. And then, then it would be Cupid. Uh, he is he is standing in contrapposto, by the way. If you want to write, you don't have to. Yeah. Plenty of notes on that pose from last week. If you didn't see the Greek art slides, you do want to study those. They're already posted now on YouTube. Anyway, so he is, you could say he's standing in contrapposto, but that doesn't really define whether he's stable. He is. Look carefully. He's standing up, right? But the only things dynamic here are his raised arm, right? and the folds of his robe and one leg, the bottom half of one leg. So it's mostly stable. Uh, and then we have overlapping for the only technique for space, but it's real, he was six feet tall, by the way. There are, there are emperors who were taller, not many, but he was a good height. That was taller than most Roman men were. So six foot tall, uh, a life-size figure of an adult Roman uh, <clears throat> man, obviously. And then we have, um, let's see, balance, well, yeah. It's a human figure standing upright. And there's no modeling. It's only the sunlight from the museum where it's on display that creates that. Um, I guess you could say Cupid. Yeah, you could say there's overlapping. I'm sorry. Cupid overlaps the tree trunk here and his clothing overlapped his body. All right, let's do at least two more. And then we'll take a break. Yeah, we'll do two more and take a break. This is um, the Pont du Gard. P-O-N-T, and then D-U-G-A-R-D. That's three words. Pont means bridge in, I believe, Latin. Um, it, could, it could be Italian or Latin. I'm not sure which, yeah. Or even French, because it's in France. So I'll say the title again and slowly spell it. P-O-N-T, Pont du, second word, D-U, and then G-A-R-D. Its location is Nîmes, N-I-M-E-S, France. So if it's on the exam, you need to remember the city. It's actually just outside this city. I've seen it. It's an amazing thing when you look at it in real life. N-I-M-E-S, Nîmes is pronounced France. So you need to have both the city and the country. 15 A.D. So what is this? This is an aqueduct, okay? So that's one of the only two remaining definitions for tonight. It, it is on your um, list of terms. So you have that, you should uh, write this as, as w close to the term itself as you can. An aqueduct is number four on the things, that list of things invented by ancient Romans. An aqueduct is a system for carrying water from the mountains to a city. I'm sorry, it's a long definition. There's no way to shorten it. I'll say it slowly and repeat it. Um, a system for carrying water from the mountains to a city invented by the ancient Romans. You have to say ancient, not the modern one. <laughs> by the ancient Romans, comma, which uses gravity and a series of uh, conduits supported by arches to carry the water, which uses gravity and a series of conduits. There's no other word for it. They're not tubes or tunnels. Conduits, just spell it how it sounds, supported by arches to carry the water. So what does that mean? Everybody got that, right? Okay, these, all three of these, it's a three level. Some aqueducts were only two levels, but they are at least two levels. That's why I said conduits, plural. Some were four and five stories or levels high. This is rather remarkably tall, but it's got just three levels. So what that is, is a roadbed. Now modern trucks and buses and bicycles and, and groups of students, I've sat here and watched this it's a bridge between two sections of uh, Southern France, just outside the city it once served. Of course, it's not functioning anymore. Well, there are a few aqueducts, there are in Africa actually, that still bring water 2000 years later to those towns where they were originally built, but that's rare. 
So it's a non-functioning segment or section, but it is the largest remaining section of a Roman aqueduct in Europe, in southern France. And it's over uh, a third of a mile long. It goes way beyond the edge of the picture here and beyond this hill, uh, sections of it. So it's, or just say about, it's about a third of a mile long. And it is 165 feet tall. That's like a 16 story skyscraper from if you were to measure from the foot here down at the water level to the top. That is pretty remarkable. If you start thinking about it, you, I think you can visualize this in your own imagination. It's mind blowing to stand underneath it and watch whole school buses dwarfed by the size of the arches above them go across because this is the only roadbed. It was always a roadbed. The Romans were smart enough to combine you know, multi-use structures, right? That's the idea we now have some places, of course, in our modern society. Uh, but those were, uh, you know, Roman, uh, that, sorry, where the arrow is, the bottom level, first, first uh, level. Uh, at the top had both the conduits for the water, which flowed, uh, you know, down, of course, down towards the city. Gravity, of course, as I said, with the definition, is what made the water continue flowing towards the city. And of course, when it got to the city, uh, inside the city walls, it was uh, deposited, you know, into or flowed into large reservoirs, which of course were covered to prevent evaporation. But they did not cover the conduits here because they didn't need to. The water was flowing quickly. And then of course it didn't, in the middle of August, probably there was no water. But when the mountains had snow for all those weeks or months, the water would flow quickly and, and go right into these conduits. And they were open conduits. So there were two more up here. And these are, of course, our arches. Now, remember the, the, the curved or rounded arch is an Etruscan idea, but no Etruscan ever tried to do this. So the row of arches supporting the weight of a structure is a Roman idea. It's the last fact you can write about the meaning of this. The idea of supporting anything such as, a, as a, um, an aqueduct or a Colosseum. We're going to see the Colosseum after the break and talk about some of the myths about the Colosseum and some of the truths about it, what really went on there. Um, but in any case, large structures in the Roman Empire that had rows of arches, they're called arcades, allowed for these multi-story uh, sites or, or uh, constructions. So this three levels, each one is supported by the row of arches below it. Okay, that's pretty much the entire meaning on this. Uh, formal analysis, it's balanced. Yeah. You draw a middle down the middle, uh, a line, I mean, down the middle. Uh, the largest mass would be the lowest row of arches. Look how wide they are. And then the second row, and then it's pretty obvious the smallest row up at the top is the uh, third and smallest mass. This is a warm color, the color of sandstone, pretty much. I don't think that stone is actually sandstone, but whatever it is, it's sand color. An earth tone. Uh, and of course, the rhythm of the uh, piers, these are called piers. You can say pylons if you want, but piers is the right word that support the arches. The piers and the arches, that's it. They're just two. And those, the arches, of course, are the dynamic section. The piers are um, pylons and the, the uh, conduits are stable. So it's both. Um, and for space, I already mentioned, it's about a third of a mile long and 165 feet tall. There's only the natural modeling from the sun. And then, of course, there's visual lines under the arches. Um, yeah, and the texture is the real rough texture of the stove. Okay, now I'm going to see if we've got, what time is it? I want to make sure. Yeah, we'll be fine. We're just, now you can rest your, your hands again. And I think I did, I, maybe I put this in. Some, I make a little alteration here and there. No, I'll give you guys a break. Um, um, in the, um, sometimes I use this as a must know, but it isn't. This is the, um, House of the Dionysian Cult. You've heard who Dionysus was if you were watching last week's lecture or you've viewed it on YouTube. It's, it was, uh, he was the ancient Greek god of wine and debauchery, some would say, or partying. Well, what's happening here is that um, this is a, in Pompeii. You have to write this. This was found in Pompeii. I've stood here. In fact, this is actually my slide. I think it is. Anyway, it's the same view, maybe different version of it, the same view. 
of a cult of people who were so corrupt and horrible because they abused little children. And even in ancient Rome, some of you know, they were rather libertine, some say, or wild and, you know, uh, very unethical, some would say amoral in their personal lives. There's plenty of evidence for that. That's not an exaggeration or stereotype. That doesn't mean all the people, most people live normal daily lives with their families. But among the upper classes, there was plenty of corruption and abuse. But this is this even for Roman standards was over the top. So much so that the cult of the Dionysian, or this is the house of the Dionysian cult. So the cult was just called the cult of Dionysus, was outlawed. The Roman governor of each province was supposed to wipe out each sect if they found them. So they had to hide their activities. And that's what this is. It's underground in what would then have been the basement of a wealthy family, obviously well-to-do family can have a big series of frescoes across the entire basement wall like this. And this poor little girl, I didn't want to talk about it, but she would be uh, about to be initiated in ways we don't even want to think about. Child abuse is putting it mildly, obviously physical, emotional, and sexual abuse was happening all the time. And then there's, you know, slave, probably she was a slave about to dance here. And here's someone getting a massage and then here's people getting drunk. Um, you know, it moved beyond the nor normal Roman orgies that we've all heard of. This, this was a, uh, a obscene cult. I think that's the right word, yeah. An abusive cult that even the Romans found, found too objectionable, so they outlawed it. But they had chapters in every major Roman city. Here's proof right there in the middle of the ruins of Pompeii. You can go see it if you're there. This is also not a must-know anymore. I took it off the list. But wow, is it powerful it, proof of, of a fact that when we get to the next must-know, and then we'll take a break. Uh, so you don't have to write the, this fact now, but I'll repeat it. The Romans were the greatest fresco artists in the ancient world. Nobody argues with that. Now they had stood on the shoulders. I like that phrase. They had learned from their predecessors in Egypt, Babylon, and Greece, of course. So, you know, there's an example of, you know, developing things from previous cultures that, you know, some people comment on today. In any case, it's the way the world was. So they had taken some techniques from the uh, previous cultures, but they developed their own new techniques with their fresco painting. This is on the wall of the house of Livia. She was the wife of Augustus, the one whose adopted son became the second emperor. And here's the myth about her. I mean, the myth, the, the rumor about her. So I didn't say myth. There's evidence to back it up that she had Augustus's two biological sons murdered under uh, uh, suspicious circumstances. They both died of accidents at sea on calm waters in the daytime, and they were excellent swimmers. <laughs> well, we don't know. But anyway, that left only her son to become his adopted son and his successor, which he then, of course, that is her son, when he became the next emperor, declared her a goddess. <laughs> and she had temples built to her. So her name was Livia. So this is on the wall of Livia's villa. Why not Augustus's villa or Livia and Augustus? Because they kept separate households and they both had their own sets of lovers. That's just the way it was among the upper classes in Rome at that time. And most of the Roman emperor, there were some emperors that didn't do that. But uh, certainly Augustus had his own series of intimate relations and so did she. They they were both married and, and had grown children by the time they, you know, I think they even had started their relation before they were divorced from their first spouses. In any case, that wouldn't have been too surprising in ancient Rome. But what's important about this is the style of it. Look at the details and techniques. That's um, they, The Roman fresco artists were the first culture, at least in ancient Western art, you don't have to write this, to use atmospheric perspective. This is the hills outside of Rome. I've walked through them. I've hitchhiked through them. I've taken trains through them. I've gotten, you know, uh, friends' cars drive up into the mountains and have picnics. It's wonderful. Outside of Rome, there are all these wonderful places uh, that surround the, the city on the hillsides. So back then, of course, the hills were even more dominant because they didn't have many suburbs, a few, but not like today. Rome has 8 million people, Greater Rome. Now, back then it was 1 to 2 million, right? So, so you could see the hills and the pollution was not like it is now. So you could see in the morning, the sun is about to rise over the mountains or they're tall hills, they're not really mountains. 
and you see the blue hazy look, you see it there, and then look at the perspective. Do they have scientific perspective? I think Stockstead used to say they did, and now we found evidence that no, they did not use a vanishing point. They didn't have that technique. The Renaissance artist invented it, uh, but they had some, uh, um, what's the right, eye hand, well, freehand, there is, that's the phrase I meant, freehand approximation of uh, scientific perspective. They figured out the concept without the technique and they used it to look at the way the garden walls, uh, you know, veer off and, in, in, of course, they're foreshortened, obviously. So there's foreshortening, overlapping for, uh, and atmospheric perspective and a freehand version of scientific perspective. It's pretty amazing. Very realistic, of course, a landscape of her garden out behind her villa. They found her villa, so that's where this is. It's on display. You can see it now if you want to go to that part of Rome. Okay, this is the next month, so I'm going to take a break. Okay, this one is um, Cityscape. It's on the same page as the rest for week seven. One word, just like it sounds, Cityscape. And it's uh, from Bosco Real. That's B-O-S-C-O-R-E-A-L-E. B-O-S-C-O-R-E-A-L-E. It's a city in uh, Italy, 30 BC. This was a wealthy uh, Roman, you know, nobleman who owned, we know who he was, owned uh, multiple villas, one in Rome, which this illustrates, and then one in the countryside and probably several others, I should say, in the countryside. But this is on the walls of his country villa, the one that's been found, uh, you know, by archaeologists. So it displays or uh, depicts, is a better word, depicts or illustrates his urban villa. So here we have on the wall of his rural villa, a scene from his urban villa. So I've had students say, that's not very Zen, right? He, he couldn't be where you are, right? Now the phrase, you're supposed to be in touch with whatever your actual surroundings are at any given moment, supposedly, according to some of my friends who practice Zen Buddhism. This guy was thinking about being back in the city when he was in the country and vice versa. Guess what fresco is on the wall of his uh, urban or Roman city villa, a scene painted of his rural villa. <laughs> that just, I guess, partly was showing off how much property he owned. That maybe it's probably the real thing, reason for that. Anyway, what we have here are signs of wealth is all the main parts of the meaning here. Look at this. This is marble. Whoops, I didn't mean to move the picture. That's a marble entrance gate. That's solid bronze doorway. And then this is a marble column with gold. It's called gilt, G-I-L-T, not G-U-I-L-T. <coughs> gilt is, is, you know, actual gold paint with real gold. Some of you know this, that they use on some tombstones and things. Anyway, here it is on a marble column just for show, planted on the street to show off to every passerby how wealthy it is. But the most remarkable thing of all, the most mind-blowing thing here is the glass in the window. Glass was expensive and rare. Only about 5% of Roman homes ever had any glass and usually with just one or two windows in maybe the main bedroom or the living room of the villas, of the upper class, of course. <clears throat> and he had glass in the windows. We know this from some of the archeological diggings of this site here, because this is part of a site that's been found by archeologists. So glass in the windows of all of the you know, walls of his uh, urban villa shows off even more than the gold and the marble and the bronze or brass, I should say, how wealthy he was. Lastly, we have up here, what is this? Soldier Field in Chicago, by the way. It's where, when I grew up, it was still look, look like this. It doesn't anymore now, it's been re rebuilt. The football stadium in downtown Chicago. So what is this? This was the Circus Maximus on a hill above the main city. So it shows you where his villa was. These are other jumbled together villas that are not very accurate. So let's get a closer look and let's do this. Whoops. Yeah, there we go. That's what I want. You see that the columns, all that could hold over 200,000 people, twice what any American stadium can hold today. It was the largest outdoor amphitheater in, in the world. People think the Coliseum was, or it was one of the biggest, and we'll talk about it right after the break. But this was even bigger. It was where the chariot races were held. So this places his villa and you know its location in a very specific way, so people could tell if they came to his urban or his uh, country villa and had dinner with him. They'd oh, so you own a place on whatever street or whatever hill, just below the hill of which, of course, is dominated above that 
neighborhood by the Circus Maximus, the uh, horse and chariot racing. They did both, horse race and chariot racing. There. So that's pretty much on the meaning, except to show one last fact, and then we'll do a quick form analysis and take a break. This shows the lack of skill of some, or lesser, don't say lack. I mean, it has certain techniques that are skilled. Just say lesser skill level of some fresco painters, not to the level, in other words, the skill of this painter. Uh, of the last two frescoes we just saw, especially Casa Olivia. <clears throat> in other words, he could not do, let's do space first for the form analysis. He couldn't depict space accurately. Look at this. These are all jumbled together here. These don't line up with each other. There's no common, they didn't have a vanishing point. We know that, I just said that. They didn't know that technique, but they could do that freehand version. We just saw that. So here this artist had no idea of how to do that. He's just jumbling up different buildings and balconies side by side in a kind of a, you know, free for all. So it doesn't depict uh, space very accurately. What it does use for space is overlapping and foreshortening and diminishing size. It does have that, of course. Diminishing size, overlapping, foreshortening. <clears throat> that it does well. The simulated texture is superb, though, on the glass, on the brass, <laughs> brass and the glass, and on the uh, marble column and the gate and on the wood balcony, that's wood, of course, and stone balconies and walls in the back. There's plenty of rhythm with those balconies and the columns and the, the gate here, lots of rhythm. It is mostly stable. The only thing dynamic you could really say is uh, the diagonal line at, at the, the top of the columns on the Circus Maximus. Otherwise, it's almost entirely stable. The largest mass, probably the column, then the, the gateway, and then this section of the wall. And then you decide beyond that. You only have to give me the three largest masses. Um, the modeling is very strong and realistic on the walls and the, you know, on these columns here from, you know, sunlight here, even here, it's done pretty well there. Uh, as I said, it's mostly stable, uh, balanced roughly. I would say it's roughly balanced. If you're curious, what is this? It's the ancient uh, tragedy mask that the Greeks, again, they were copying the Greeks here. A Roman theater was pretty much just Greek theater with some new playwrights adding new stories and performing in Latin and Greek, the original Greek plays that they were copying. So that's the ancient Greek symbol, right, of a mask for tragedy, if you're curious. So he probably had a theater in his villa and had amateur plays, you know, to entertain his guests. Okay, let's see, am I forgetting anything? Visual line, mass, volume, rhythm. I think we've got it all. Yeah, okay, let's take a break. All right, 20 minutes, and I'll see you all uh, 20 minutes from now, okay. Okay, uh, we're going to do a couple of them. I think you will agree of the most interesting slides of the topic of ancient Roman art. <clears throat> um, and at this point, uh, that's on the next page. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think it's easier to stick to a single file. I actually spent a couple of hours or a long time this afternoon moving slides around from different files all into this one file. So we didn't have that, you know, delay that we had a couple of times going back and forth. But next week, there may be a short delay when I switch from the last few remaining must knows. Uh, that we'll do first uh, on week eight. And so turn, if you haven't already turned your syllabus to the next page, and then I'll show you my own slides of Rome, and then we'll take our break. And as I said, after the break, we'll decide, I mean, I will have sent you an email, send everyone an email as to whether or not we're going to have the midterm at the scheduled date, which is two weeks and tonight, or postpone it. But either way, I will do a review of how the test is gonna be given and how to study for it in the second half of next week. Okay, this is not a must know. I just wanted you to see one more example of Roman fresco art that is indicative of their skills. This is Hercules returns home after a 20 year odyssey. It's an ancient Greek myth. As I said, I think most everyone knows by now that the Roman just copied the Greeks uh, religious beliefs. They just changed the names of the gods <clears throat> and heroes. And so here's Hercules, look how buff he is. <laughs> Um, and how detailed uh, everything is from his hair and his facial features, his muscles, 
Uh, and that's his swooning, I guess she seems to be, or sh surprised, I don't know, shocked is too strong a word, uh, mother there lying back after seeing her son for the first time in 20 years. And this is probably an aunt or some other relative, uh, maybe a neighbor. Anyway, it's, a, it's on a wall of a villa in Rome. I've seen it. And it has that same red color. I, I love that. It's actually a color that has a name among interior decorators to this day since it was rediscovered in the 1700s, that is Pompeii, and all of these walls that had this color, that's called Pompeii red, were imitated beginning in the late 1700s. There were houses in colonial America that had those colors on their walls and still do. The few that I've been to on the East Coast that are intact or restored and open to the public, many of them use that color. It was very popular throughout the Western world after uh, Pompeii was rediscovered by archaeologists, Italian archaeologists, or German, actually, I think they were German, in the mid-1700s, that far back, and they've been excavating that site ever since. Okay, now we get to one of those you definitely want to take extra thorough notes on. That should be obvious because of the, uh, the fact that it is the Colosseum, the first well, that's hard to prove. I don't know for that fact of all Colosseums in the Roman Empire, but it's by far the largest and most famous. So you could just say it that way. Colosseum, the title, of course, is C-O-L-O-S-S-E-U-M. Colosseum. Location, of course, is Rome. And the date it was completed is 8080 AD, or uh, uh, if you prefer common era CE. Okay, so this is a nice shot of it because it gives you some sense of the scale. Look how small the cars are down here. Let's get up closer. Now, those are tiny little Italian cars. And in case you're not familiar, some of you may be from seeing, I don't know, movies from the 1960s or, well, thereabouts, filmed in Italy. <laughs> that, that's an old photo, but it doesn't matter because there isn't that much of a change. I don't mean the cars all look the same. But the scale of the vehicles, look at the bus there, right? There are two tourist bus. There's always, every time I've been to Rome four times, every time I come to the Colosseum, I usually go there more than once on each visit because it's so mind blowing and so impressive and so interesting. Sometimes on my own, sometimes with a tour guide or a group. Um, anyway, the point is that whenever you go, you're going to see huge groups and numbers of tourists coming in and out at any given time when it's open during daylight hours. And then here we have some people walking by it to give it scale. Okay, well, let's go back to the full view, the distance shot. <clears throat> okay, so I think most of you know some of the facts about it, but there are myths about it as well. So let's talk about the commonly known facts, which if you didn't already know these, you should be writing as part of the meaning. Um, this was the uh, most famous and largest of all the uh, oval, and it was oval. You don't say round. It's oval, oval-shaped outdoor arenas. You could say amphitheater, but that maybe has a slightly different meaning, but either word would do. Arena or amphitheater. It was one of the largest ever built in the Roman Empire. Many historians believe the largest. Of all the remaining ones, it is the largest. So just say it was possibly, or prob actually probably, just say it that way, probably the largest of all the Roman arenas outdoor amphitheater is another way to say it. And of course, some of you may know that it was used for a variety of live combat as entertainment, but a lot more than that happened here. So first you'd say it was used for gladiator combat, yes, in which they were fights to the death to entertain the masses of spectators. We'll get to how many could fit in here in, in a few minutes, uh, which were put on by the government. The government of Rome, the emperor actually, usually the emperor himself, uh, arranged the games, had people, and of course he didn't do it personally, well sometimes he did, uh, pick the, the contestants, the gladiators who would fight, and paid them. And of course those that survived enough times would eventually get their freedom, they were slaves. I don't know if anyone saw the movie uh, Gladiator, it's quite good with Russell Crowe. It's a very accurate depiction of what this type of event site was like and what it was like to be a slave forced to fight for your life in ancient Rome. Okay, so that was for public entertainment provided by the emperor and you could say therefore by the government. And it was free to the public. 
okay, it was like several times a month there would be different games. Sometimes in the winter, if it was bad weather, they might go a month or so without, but, but they didn't only have them in the summer. And another thing that happened there were mock naval battles between, uh, they'd flood the floor of the Colosseum, this is all part of the meeting, and have uh, wooden ships big enough to hold uh, several, not maybe a dozen, but you know, maybe six or so gladiators on these small wooden ships. And then they would attack each other, ram each other, and, and of course board each other's ships and fight each other to the death, or until they could catch the other opposing gladiators wooden boat on fire or sink it somehow. Um, Mock naval battles, that, that is mind boggling when you think about it. They flooded the, the, the floor of the Coliseum. That didn't happen very often. In fact, it was only a few times, but more than once or twice. And then we had, the, some of you know this, um, during the persecution of Christians and other, not just Christians, but uh, Jews and, and gypsies and other religious and ethnic minorities, both, uh, that the Romans had conquered or occupied the territory of and were trying to suppress their religious beliefs, right? If they didn't subscribe to the Roman gods, that was, there was already an outlaw. They were outlaws, the, the Christians, the Jews, the gypsies. So what sometimes they do when they caught them was uh, literally torture them to death. And those, are, some of you may know this, if you're not, you should write this. One way was to have, yes, they did, lions, hungry, hungry lions with um, victims tied to posts and of course, Today, most of us couldn't even imagine watching something like that, but the crowds would cheer and, and maybe make bets on who would survive the longest, who would be the last one to be eaten. Other times they burned them at the stake or they shot them full of arrows until they bled to death. There were all kinds of horrific ways to torture various minority groups that were prison, you know, caught, not prisoners. They weren't prisoners. They were, you know, underground, you know, rebels in some way, not willing to convert uh, to or, or live quietly under Roman rule or convert to the Roman religion um, or swear allegiance to the emperor, what have you. So yeah, that's pretty grim and uh, grisly. But why is it called the Colosseum? That's part of the meaning. Some of you may know it was based, uh, the term was based on the presence of a colossal, that's the only word, colossal statue of Nero that once stood on this site. This very site was where Nero had his mansion, his villa, which is really more than one building, you know, a compound, you could say it that way. Uh, it's actually a slight hill, or was, that actually was level to build the Colosseum. So there was a slight hill, there was a large compound, or, you know, you could just say villa. Nero, of course, was crazy, right? He was the one that burned Rome and then blamed it on the Christians. Uh, so when he died, people were so happy that he was dead that they uh, pulled down a statue and it was, you know, pieces of that statue, some say, we, I don't know if there's proof of this, were used to start the construction of the Colosseum. And anyway, that's where the word Colosseum came from, from the colossal statue of Nero that was torn down on this site after he died. And then lastly, as far as the meaning goes here, well, actually there's two, two more things. You can see where the arrow is. There's empty space. And if you've ever seen movies or film or photos of this, uh, you know, from a distance where you see the whole curve of the oval outer walls, about a third of the outer walls are missing. That's the way to write it. Why? Oh, they fell down. They were poorly constructed. No, nothing like that. They were taken away. You could say stolen, but I, I guess because it was the Pope and he had the power, it wasn't illegal. You could just say removed by a Pope during the Renaissance for the outer walls of St. Peter's Church. This is an amazing fact that should have some you know, impact on your perception of how huge this place is. And then the last thing is about how many people, we'll end the meaning section with that in just a moment. But to finish that second to the last fact about the meaning is just one third, here's the way to write it, of the uh, stone from the outer walls of the Colosseum was enough to build the largest church in the world, it still is. St. Peter's is the largest Christian church on earth. In fact, I don't know if any other house of worship is big. And if you've not seen pictures of it at Christmas when the Pope you know, gives his Christmas address, it's immense. <clears throat> and that is really another way of thinking uh, that perhaps helps you give you perspective how huge this is. It's the second largest man-made structure and it was only men that worked on it.
so we can say it that way, uh, the second largest man-made structure in the ancient world after the Great Pyramid of Giza. Or was it? There was a debate because the Circus Maximus was not as tall as this, but it was longer and it had more seats. So it's hard to judge. But of all the remaining sites that we can measure, uh, there are plenty all around the ancient world, right around the Mediterranean. Uh, this is the second largest structure uh, that's left still, at least mostly standing. And it would be intact if it wasn't for that Pope stealing stones in the middle of the night. No, of course not. He, ha he had the authority to take it, wor tell war crews to start removing sections of it. A later Pope who came along after he died uh, ordered this, the cessation of that because this was considered a sacred site because so many Christians had died here. The last thing is, what about the capacity? There's a debate. So you can say many stones believe 50,000, but I don't buy that. I've, I've been to the Oakland Coliseum. Anybody here been to the Oakland Coliseum? Probably not, right? When the, when the A's were in the World Series way back, and I don't know if they're going to make it this time, but they went several years in a row in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Anyway, when, yeah, I've seen 50,000 people, and I can tell you this place is bigger than that. So just say many historians believe it could hold up to 70,000 people when it was at full capacity, which means SRO, of course, standing room only. And if you were uh, in, in the cheap seats where the arrow is, the bleachers, you were packed elbow to elbow, like sardines. And there were standing room only uh, uh, seats also available. Well, there weren't seats, excuse me, spaces, uh, uh, you know, uh, areas where, where people just stood. And those were, of course, the mostly the various poorest uh, spectators. So many historians, and I'm one of them, believe it could hold up to 70,000, somewhere between 50 and 70,000. And last but not least on the meaning, may, may have heard this, but if not, you should definitely write this. They never called a game or a gladiator, in other words, no gladiator contest or lion eating <laughs> spectacle. No, no event was ever canceled due to weather. Well, you probably know this. It rains like cats and dogs in Rome in the summer, and it can get you know, as hot as 115 degrees with no shade. There's no shade in here. So wouldn't you think they would have occasionally canceled? No. How did they do that? Because they had a dome. No, not really. Literally a dome. But they had a, a covering made out of, um, most people believe it was made out of canvas. A massive stitched, you can say, or sewn canvas covering. You can say awning if you want, but that's not really what it was. It was a, a huge, it had to be, to cover this entire space of 70,000 capacity below the, which was, there we go, which was then taken up, uh, you know, by rope and pulled, stretch is the right word, out across the, with ropes and pulleys, of course, uh, by Roman soldiers who were stationed permanently during games on the upper wall. So that, in other words, if it started to rain and the poor Christians prayed for rain, now oh, that'll save me another day, you know, then uh, they can't burn me. Or maybe the lions won't come out because, you know, cats don't like water. Right? <laughs> uh, that didn't help. All it did was delay your death or the rest of the spectacle by 20 minutes. Now, I think that's the most remarkable fact of all, that these soldiers could take this very primitive form of roof covering, temporary and stored as it was, you know, bunched up to, along the upper walls with ropes attached, you know, and pulleys to make it easy to, uh, you know, kind of unwind it, and then stretched out across the middle. And then you might think, well, then it's all dark underneath, so that would haul the gate. No, no, they had a, a big wide opening in the middle enough to let the sun shine down on the poor victims, whoever they were, the Christians, the gladiators, whatever, and just enough to light up the um, floor in the middle for the games to continue. So they never took more than 20 minutes to cover this. And if you've never been to a um, retractable uh, roof stadium, I have Toronto, Canada, the Blue Jays, the baseball team. I've watched that. It took 45 minutes. For them, they had to postpone the game 45 minutes for the retractable mechanical rope. The Romans had them beat by half or less than half of that amount of time. They were pretty engineering uh, were marvels, the Romans. They were, they were geniuses in, in their designs and you know, the engineering and their architecture.
was way ahead of any other culture before them. And we still imitate them. Obviously, Colosseums are found all over the world. All right, that's the meaning, formal analysis. Well, when it was new, it was completely uh, balanced and symmetrical, of course. You could say it's weighted toward, in this picture, towards the left now, because it's missing this section here. Uh, and then we have the rhythm of the columns and the arches, of course. Uh, and those arches are dynamic and the overall shape of the building oval is dynamic, but each individual, right, column and each section of walls is stable. For space, it's real space. This, the dimensions are this. Each level is 40 feet high, so do the math, that's 160 feet tall, this structure. By far the tallest Colosseum ever built. I think it's taller than any modern one, but certainly in the ancient world. Uh, 160 foot tall walls at 40 foot segments each. And then I just said the uh, opening interior, I'm sorry, could, could hold between 50, just say up to 70,000 people. So it's real space. Uh, and then we have um, the real texture. There's no semi texture of the rough stone. Uh, it had marble lining, but the marble's missing. Okay. Uh, and then we have, is it stable or, well, I already covered, oh yes, dynamic, uh, sorry, I meant line. line. Lines are visual, not uh, carved, although if you go up close, you could see them, but you can't in this picture. If it's on the exam, it'll be this image. I might hit that, you know, enlargement just once or twice while you're writing your answers. If you're taking the, the test in real time or starting to, and then take it, remember, you can take it back with you wherever and work on it overnight, right? Uh, you'd have up to 48 hours to turn it in the midterm. I mean. So uh, I might show you the close-ups, but from here you can't see it. So just say there is uh, just the visual line under the arches and around the, uh, the edges of the columns. And that's where the modeling is. It's a natural modeling from the sun. There's no technique for modeling. Uh, the largest mass, there is no largest mass. All four sections are the same height. I mean, it might look like this is taller, but actually once you, you add in this and this, they're, they're all about the same height. So it's really just four equal masses. Okay, uh, texture, line, balance, modeling, rhythm, I think. Oh, and the color is a cool gray color. All right, now we get to the other one of the second half that is so important that I definitely will not cut this. This is such a unique structure. That's why I ask if anybody's been to Rome. I already asked, right? There's no one who joined us new. I can see that from the, the number of participants. So. I would ask again, because if you have, you never forget what it's like to walk inside this structure. Okay, this is the Pantheon, one word, P-A-N-T-H-E-O-N, -E Pantheon, from Rome, of course, and the date is 125 AD, or CE, if you prefer. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We are looking at the largest domed building ever built in the Roman Empire. You can't say in the ancient world, and I'll say why in about three weeks, I guess, after the midterm, when we get to Islamic art, uh, depending on when the midterm is actually held uh, or given. Um, but when we get to Islamic architecture, we're going to look at the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which just got converted. Some of you know this from a... Uh, an open museum to any group or religious, you know, uh, background, and it's now converted back into a mosque, which is not what it was built for. So it's, I think it's kind of sad that happened. But in any case, it's not open to the public as freely as it used to be. That's an Istanbul. That is a bigger dome. So I'll say it again. Here's the way to write this. And remember, this is really an important slide. I'm not definitely not cutting this or the Colosseum from the study list for the midterm. Okay, so it was the largest dome building in the entire Roman Empire, and it survived intact. The whole building, even the front door and the lock on the front door have survived, and the original key still works. What does that tell you about the Romans? They knew how to build for the ages. So what is it? It was a building, a religious structure, and the name tells us what it was. But now you need to write that if you didn't already know. Pantheon means temple of all the gods. That's literally what it was. It was a temple where you could go to worship any one or all of the Roman gods at the same time. 
And this says Marcus Agrippa, you don't have to know what this says for the meaning, but just for the, those of you curious, he was the architect. He was a, an assistant to Augustus. But wait a minute, 125, Augustus didn't live 104. Uh, he ruled for 45 years, not 145. He was dead. So the original building on this site was designed in exact same style, same features, but smaller version of it by Augustus. He hired this architect, Agrippa was his name. And then it uh, either was, you know, deferred, made, I don't know why, but they tore down, a later emperor tore down the original building under Augustus and rebuilt it in much larger size, which is why it is the largest stone building ever built. So how big is it? That's part of the meaning. And we'll repeat that with the formal analysis, of course, for the dimensions for space. Okay, it's 144 feet tall. That means you could have fit a 14-story skyscraper inside this structure, and it still wouldn't quite touch the top of the ceiling. And the dome is over 140 feet wide. So I think it's 142. So just say over 140 foot wide dome with 140 foot tall uh, ceiling. That's mind boggling. There aren't many domes today in the modern world that have been built in the last say 200 years that are that big. Very few. The US Capitol building is, but you know, that was built in the 1800s uh, and a few others. Okay, now this is a temple front. This is a portico. Remember that word from last week? Uh, so it's useful to have now in your notes for this slide, you should mention it. It's like a Greek or Roman temple with a pediment and columns. So it's a portico which includes the, the pediment. There was no statues here because they didn't know which ones they would put up there. There were dozens of Greek, remember they were the same gods, Greek and Roman gods. So those statues are inside. You're gonna see a view of the inside in the next few slides. So the statues of the various gods were inside the building, not on the pediment, not outside. And you might wonder, well, wait a minute, what are these materials? Well, let's go take a look up close. This is a really nice slide. I, I couldn't have taken it if I'd wanted to. Someone hired a helicopter for this. Look at what we're looking at. That is a 2000 year old dome made out of Roman concrete without a single crack or ever needed to be repaired. Uh, again, if you start to think about that, how many buildings, look, look at what happened with the uh, Bay Bridge. Part of it collapsed and then they built a new one and the piers on uh, part of the new section of the bridge that cost $7 billion and took 20, well, 15 years to actually build is already rusting. I don't want to be on that bridge during the next big earthquake. I wouldn't uh, lay odds on the survival rate of anybody caught on that bridge in a 7.5 quake or bigger. And we can't build that well in the modern world. It's mind boggling. That is the original Roman concrete dome. Look how perfect it is. They've never had to repair or replace any of it. So those are two of the facts you need to know about this very important facts. Two things invented by the Romans were used on this building and are beautifully displayed and show up in this slide. Well, they show it in the other slide too. That is concrete, the Romans invented that. No one had it before them. Concrete and domes. Again, there were no domes before the Romans. The domes come from Rome, or Rome invented the dome. And that's how one of my teachers used to say it. And then of course, concrete is what is used to make the dome. But why are the walls this cheap brick? Uh-uh, oh no, that's not what it was. There, again, another pope, another thief, well, what do we call him, thief, another rather, um, you know, grasping Roman emperor who wanted to, I'm sorry, Roman emperor, I misspoke, pope in the Renaissance, that's when these things happen, stripped the walls of all the marble that once lined them, uh, the outer walls, not the inner walls, and built several Christian churches in the neighborhood around this building. Uh, so you can actually tell that, you know, that was a huge amount of marble. If you could build more than a couple of churches out of just the outer covering, of, that's an, a massive amount of marble. <coughs> Again, they didn't want to pay for, you know, mining new marble, I guess, out in the Italian mountains. And then look at the, the portico. The portico is huge. Let's go back and I'll make this point even clearer. Look how big that is when you're standing on the ground. These columns are 46 feet high. Uh, but that we'll get to that when we repeat that when we get to the uh, formal analysis, and look how they're dwarfed the columns and the entire portico by the rest of the building, because it's more than a hundred feet taller or higher than the portico, the dome that is. 
Okay, let's take a look at what was inside. This is a painting, but it's very accurate. Now I have some really good slides I'll be showing you next week of, of a lot more than just one view, but some details and a view of this here. What was that? It's called the oculus. You don't have to write that word. You can just say a 30 foot wide opening in the top of the dome. Why? Because they ran out of concrete? No because they wanted the gods to be able to look down on their worshipers or worshipers to look up and think they could see the gods or imagine that they could see the gods that they were praying to. But there is another practical reason. Romans were always both symbolic and practical with their architecture. What is that? Drainage. It rains, I just said a little earlier, if you didn't write that, now you should. When it rains, heavy, heavily, you know, just say heavy rainfall happens. Every summer it happens like almost every day in the summer in Rome. The uh, the concrete could be somewhat, you know, compromised by the beating of the rain, but even more so, it could perhaps leak through some of the seams. After all, it's con it's not one solid piece of concrete, obviously. It's layers. So you could have flooding or dripping. You could just say that, you know, seepage of water. That doesn't happen. The water comes straight down here, and then it does never flood. Why? Because the floors are tilted only so slightly. You can hardly tell towards the walls, and in the walls are several sewage outlets or drainage pipes is a better word, because there's no sewage in this building. It's a sacred building. Uh, they didn't have that issue. But the point is the water that came through the opening and then hit the floor would drain steadily so it never ever flooded, no matter how long or how heavy the rain, the water would go out into the Tiber, right? The river, the, the river that runs through Rome. It's a major river, of course. So the water was, was directed into drainage pipes. It's remarkable. And then here you have these columns that were about, uh, these inside are about uh, 30 feet. No, more like, well, yeah, that's about right, 30 feet. And the door, was 25 feet tall. Here it's open, of course. I'm gonna show you a close-up of that door with my own slides. And I'll tell you something that it might surprise some of you and you might not even believe it about how the building is used today and how it's maintained. Because it's open to the public, but it is a functioning church. And I'll explain more about that next week. All right, and then the last fact about the meaning, look how they lightened the dome because if it was solid concrete, it probably would have collapsed of its own weight by now. I mean, it's a massive amount of concrete. So what did they do? They put these recesses, they're called coffers, that has multiple meanings, that word can mean lots of things, C-O-F-F-E-R-S, coffers, indentations, you can say, you know, square indentations, if you want it, that's the definition of coffers, uh, which just the word will do with two Fs. Coffered ceiling is the way to say it with, with an E-D. It's a coffered ceiling, which lightens the weight of the dome by half. And that worked obviously brilliantly because it's never needed repairs. It's never had any cracks. Okay, and here are the statues of the main gods. Of course, there were so many gods that there, you know, other, other smaller images of the gods on in frescoes along the wall. But these are the most important ones here. Okay. Um, so let's now go back to, if it's on the exam, what view will you have? Well, I need you to be able to see the whole building. So it'll be this view. Okay, formal analysis. I well, already mentioned the dimensions, but let's do that again. We have balance, it's totally balanced left to right, but it's weighted toward the bottom because the dome is narrower than the walls, of course. Uh, and then we have the rhythm of the columns and uh, these, these, you could just say decorative stonework. There's a name for that, but I'm not going to give you that. It's too much detail for you to have to write. Uh, and of course, that creates rhythm, as do the ridges in the dome itself, the concrete. You could just say the concrete dome uh, <coughs> segments or sections or ridges, any of those words, uh, create rhythm. Uh, so there's lots of rhythm. It is both stable and dynamic. Of course, the dome is dynamic and the round walls are. The portico, well, the pediment is dynamic, but the columns are stable. And then this segment is stable and the, the wall here, all of that is flat, this wall here. That's why this is that way. So it, you can have a flat you know, entryway and gateway doors and windows in the front. So it's both stable and dynamic, but more dynamic than stable. The modeling is the shadows in between the columns from the sun. There's visual and carved lines. See the words, you don't have to know what they mean again, but those words that they actually describe or uh, name the architect, but anyway, you can just say the lettering is carved line. And then there is the visual line, of course, at the edges of uh, the pediment and the corners. 
The largest mass, it is, let's go again and you'll see if it's not obvious, it's the dome, whoops. Well, you can see it hidden in this picture too. The dome is the largest mass and then the outer walls and then the portico in that order. Because remember the dome goes all the way down to here and this makes it look shallower than it is. But that is a good 60 or 70 feet there from there from the base of the dome. Okay, so it's in that order. Three masses of the dome, the outer walls, the portico. Um, let's see, uh, what, are, what are we, um, oh yeah, texture is a real smooth texture of marble on the columns and smooth concrete on the dome. And now, although it was originally marble walls, it's rough today, rough, real brick texture. And those bricks, the outer walls now, are a warm earth tone, whereas the portico, including the columns, and the dome are cool grayish colors. Um, and I already mentioned for space, right? But once again, it's a dome that's over 140 feet wide and 144 feet tall. Okay, let's let's do one more and see what time it is. We might just end then. Um, I'm trying to decide whether to. Okay, yeah. All right, we'll do this one. All right, uh, the arch, the last must know for tonight. How about that? Then we'll call it a night. And I'll stick around for any questions people have after we finish the lecture. So make sure you write about this one, because again, I, I won't say for sure if it's so important that I absolutely won't cut it from the study list, but assume it could be on the midterm. Arch of Titus, T-I-T-U-S, Rome, the location in 81 AD, uh, or, or uh, CE if you prefer. So what is this? It's a triumphal arch. It's the last new definition now for tonight. The triumphal arch, here we go, that definition isn't too long, but it is on your list of things invented by the ancient Romans. So you probably can fit it into the space because it's only two lines. A triumphal arch is a large stone archway uh, invented by the Romans to commemorate a military victory. Again, a large stone archway invented by the Romans to commemorate a military victory, comma, beneath which the soldiers who won that victory would march, period, beneath which the soldiers who won that victory would march. Well, I think you know, well, some of you would at least, of a couple of examples of triumphal arches in the modern world. Anybody could think of one in Paris? Okay, the Arch of Triumph, which is the biggest triumphal arch ever built, Napoleon and his ego. The man was only five foot Five, I think, but his ego was bigger than anybody in the world at that time. He had the largest triumphal arch ever built. And of course, he's copying the Romans in doing that. And his soldiers, who, whenever they won a victory, and he won quite a few, they'd march underneath that arch. And then later, the Nazis marched under it. You've seen some of you film or photos of that when they took over France. Uh, and so a triumphal arch, again, is a large stone, sorry, stone archway invented by the Romans to commemorate a military victory, comma, beneath which the soldiers who won that victory would march. So this was the Emperor Titus. He had been a general before he was emperor. And what military victory does it celebrate? The fall of Jerusalem. Now, you don't have to be Jewish to know this, but the Jews had occupied what's now Israel for over 1400 years. When the Romans crushed their rebellion, they wanted out of the Roman empire. Mm, they probably should have thought that through, but whatever. They were a proud, right, and independent-minded province, and they'd been under Roman rule for oh, like 150 years, 200 years, and they were tired of it. So they rebelled, and the Romans crushed the rebellion, and this is the monument to that victory over the Jewish rebellion in the province of Israel. And now let's take a look at one of the most tragic nights in the history of the world. We're still paying for this. I can prove that to you with uh, just a, a tie in with uh, current events. But first, let's say what scene is it picked? The fall of Jerusalem, the last major, well, second to last major Jewish site to be uh, captured by the Romans was the city of Jerusalem, which was a walled city. And they, uh, the Jews fought ferociously to defend themselves. But when they were taken over, all the male inhabitants were either sold into slavery or executed. And the families, you know, the younger under 15, whatever, to say younger males, the uh, women and children were exiled. 
and then Arab tribes that lived around them. They weren't Arab then, but they were the forerunners, the ancestors of modern Arab peoples were imported into that territory by the Romans to uh, resettle it uh, because they were already under Roman rule. So they were Roman subjects. And uh, if it's not clear the connection of that to modern problems, I'll, I'll make the connection in a minute. But let's talk about this scene first. What, what's happening? That's a menorah. That's uh, M-E-N-O-R-A. I hope I spelled that right. Some people put an H on the end. You can just say a seven-headed candelabra which is the other way of saying a menorah. It's a, a sacred Jewish object that every synagogue has. So the main synagogue or temple, they actually called it a temple, the largest synagogue in the world was the one in Jerusalem. And the Romans were sacking it. That's the only word for it. They would sacked it. They took everything valuable out. They stole, they uh, burned the, the temple and or pulled most of the walls down, leaving one wall left, which is still there in Jerusalem where Jews consider it the most sacred site uh, for all Jews in the world. You're supposed to make a pilgrimage there. And almost every religion has that belief that there's one site, you know, like Mecca for Muslims and uh, the Ganges River for Hindus, right? And uh, Rome for Catholics, you know, the, the Vatican. But So for Jews, it's the one wall left standing by the Romans of this temple, but everything else in that site was destroyed. All the valuables, mostly gold, were stolen from the site. And then we have this mysterious thing here. What is that? It's a metal box being carried out on the shoulders of Roman soldiers. Now, see, they're not wearing their armor because the battle's over. There's nothing left but, you know, burned ruins. And the inhabitants were already being, you know, sold into slavery and so forth. So there was no need to wear their armor. Uh, they are stealing everything in sight. They had done all their raping and pillaging and, and, and yeah, many of them just killed for pleasure. Happens, right, when there's a, a fall of a big city. But this is the mystery of history that the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark is based on. That, most historians agree, had to be the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, it's real. It was real. It may still exist. We'll never know. Because unlike that movie, it's never been found. But it was a giant golden box with the remnants of the Ten Commandments. You have to write that, but just say the Ark of the Covenant. I think you can all spell those words for uh, phonetically it's fine. Uh, for hundreds of years it had sat, no, over a thousand, sorry, over a thousand years inside the temple in Jerusalem. The Romans stole it that night and it disappeared. No one has ever seen it since. So there's your mystery of history for tonight. And these things that look like mo large bulky movie cameras from the 1970s or like my uncles used to have to film our family reunions. Those are insignia for the Roman legions that sacked and, and conquered the city of Jerusalem. So it depicts an event, the last part of the meeting to finish up with, and then we'll do a formal analysis and call tonight, that this is connected to the issues or problems of the modern world, that when this province was, you know, for over 1300 years, 14 actually, over 14 centuries occupied by the Jews, and then they were forced out, they felt they should be able to come back. I'm not taking sides on this. It's so complex. And the Arab tribes that were moved in there are, by the Romans, arbitrarily, of course, under their rule, uh, also feel they should have a right to that area because their ancestors have been there for now. Let's do the math about, well, now they've been displaced. So at least 1,600 years. So, you know, both sides feel they have an equal claim to that territory that's now the state of Israel. And ergo, there lies the origins of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is still with us. And it spawns or is the, you can say, inspiration or some would say excuse, whatever, the cause for much of the terrorist acts in that part of the world and other places, including 9-11, according to Osama bin Laden. That's one of the reasons he attacked New York is because we sided with Israel. So we're still paying for this incident. You see how history isn't just a dead bunch of facts. <laughs> Sometimes it lives on and on and on. Okay, let's wrap it up uh, with a formal analysis. If it's on the exam, you'll have this view. You see that if we get closer, you can see the figures sort of, but it's not very clear. So you aren't gonna have to describe them. Um, so it's a cool gray color. And uh, this archway is about, 50 foot feet high with about a 40 foot tall opening or archway actually the top that's all new that was added thousands of years later a pope put that on with his name there and everything nothing above this 
that's called the cornice line. You don't have to know that. The top of the original arch is still, it's all intact. It's not a reconstruction or restoration, but that was added like in the 1700s, you know, not very long ago in the history of the world. So it's, it's not originally part of the uh, actual structure. So this part here was 50 feet and that's about a 40 foot high opening. That's the real space. And then we have the archway is dynamic. The rest of the structure is totally stable. The columns, the walls. Uh, there's modeling from the sun underneath the arch and, you know, a little bit on the walls. There's visual and carved line. You can see carved. Actually, I think we can go. Yeah, see, there are angels of victory there who are anointing the soldiers who won that battle of the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans. Um, they're, you know, they believe they got special rewards from the gods. So those are Roman gods and or angels of victory. Those are all done with carved line, but most of the uh, texture is the smooth texture of marble. Most of these arches were marble, uh, or you can just say stone, the real texture, except on the carved figures, which you now know there are some Roman soldiers here and angels of victory. You can just say angels uh, on the archway. Uh, the largest mass, well, it's hard to say. I mean, you can call it one mass or you could break it down into the two equal masses on either side. And then the arch itself, the archway would be the second largest because these are equally, obviously totally symmetrical. So therefore it's totally balanced. And we have the rhythm of the columns, right? And the car figures. Um, and, I, and I think I already mentioned the space. Yeah, I did. Stable and dynamic on the archway. There you go, it's one more close up. Okay, well, we're ending right about the time we usually do, so. Uh, I'm going to finish with the uh, last, I think it's four more must know slides of Roman art that we didn't get to this this week, uh, at the start of next week, and then show you my own slides of Rome just for around you know 20 to 30 minutes. And then maybe take a slightly earlier break and then uh, spend at least an hour, maybe a little more uh, talking about the midterm. But I will send an email to you before the next class to all my students as to whether or not I'm gonna keep the midterm on that date. Now for papers, if you didn't turn them in, I think everybody knows this, but I'll repeat it because I think a couple people joined us after we started. Uh, they're still on time if I get them by midnight tonight. And if you are in an area that is going to be evacuated or already has been, then you just need to email me and I will, you know, I could check, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I'll be, you know, an honor system is what I call it. I'll, I'll take your word for it. But of course, you should want to get that out of your way out of off your plate the paper because then you'll get it back with all the others you'll get the grade sooner and you aren't going to get backlog that's why i didn't move the date back if you want to know for the due date because if we start doing that we're going to end up with two papers a midterm and a final all in the last three or four weeks that's just overwhelming that's what happened in the spring and that's that's not a good formula for success and even if you could do well on them it, it's it's overtaxing all of you so uh, my department chair, I just think I told you this at the beginning, uh, I, I emailed him and he agreed that it made sense to do it this way. So anyone you know who's in the class and you know, or if you miss part of it tonight, uh, you, you can see it uh, after 7 p.m. on Friday, this entire lecture. I'll post it on YouTube as I do all the lectures. Okay, any questions? Anybody? About the papers, extra credit, uh, the slides we saw tonight, yeah, I have a question actually. Sure, go ahead. So I saw that you combined it um, in the, the next week because it said that uh, this Roman art would be connected to next week. Is that just because they're intertwined? So Yeah, you, you said it happen? exactly. You said it per I thought it made sense to, well, I'll also give you a, a logistical reason. I didn't realize that until you started talking about the column. I was like, wait, that's not on the paper of this week. And then I flipped yeah. the bro Oh, okay. I mentioned it briefly, but I didn't emphasize that. So it's a good question to clarify for anyone else who's wondering. Yeah, I reserve the right to to have a slightly different order than the syllabus for slides that are within the same subject. I would never mix up subjects. That would be really yeah. confusing. But I did that this time partly because you just said, you know, they are interconnected. Of course, it's all part of the same culture in the same eras uh, or period of history. Well, a 500 year period of history of the Roman Empire. There is a practical reason though, or logistical. And that is that I spent, as I think I mentioned, over like an hour and a half this afternoon putting uh, slides from three different sets of files that I had gotten from the slide librarian or my own slides into this one file. And so I could then just, you know, make it more smooth. And then also we'll probably, if we do the midterm, well, whenever we do it, I mean, this will benefit all of you that are 
able to, well, you should watch it live, but if you can't, you can watch the recording of next week's lecture when we have, a, that way we'll have a little more time to talk about the midterm and how to study for it, how it's gonna be great and what it looks like, you know, wh what to expect. Um, because uh, I actually got through more slides than I would if I just stick, the, you know, I could have ended the class 20 minutes earlier, but we'd have two or three more must knows to do next week. So I thought of it that way too. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, but that's a good question. You got it, you, you figured that out, right? Okay, <laughs> anybody else? Any other questions? Now's a good time uh, before we sign off. And I really am gonna say some, uh, I believe in you know, Berkeley karma is what I used to say. I'll call it whatever you wanna call it, prayers or incantations or thought, I hate that phrase, thoughts and prayers. But anyway, wishes sincerely for all of you to stay safe and that the smoke isn't as bad. I know it, it, I've heard from my reader that lives right there in the center of Santa Rosa. That's pretty bad. It was bad here last week and it's going to get bad here too. So, and that the heat doesn't, you know, that the fires are under control by this time next week. Let's, let's hope so. Thank you all for your uh, attention and your, your, um, uh, uh, focus and, and your patience. I hope you found this worth it. I, I know it's a small group, but then you guys don't have to watch it again unless you want to, but for review, you might, of course, but anyone else who wasn't here will get a chance to see it after 7 p.m. on Friday. Okay, is that it? One more time. Any other questions? All right, you guys take care. Good night. Thank you. You too. Yeah, thank you. All. Thank you. All right.